It's not that tight. Joe Rogan Podcast, check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night, all day. I'm not sure if playing that before you talk to somebody is a good idea. It seems jarring. It seems like all of a sudden, like you have to like talk it down. So it becomes like a conversation again. Because otherwise, it's like, oh, what the fuck just... In a, right? You are a neuroscientist, I am. Dr. Hill? Yeah, a cognitive would, neuroscientist. Would that not affect the way your brain... Absolutely. Reacts? Hearing sort of, you know, call to actions will change yeah. how you then react to things. Fucks with you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Does something. Yep, yep. We were talking, uh, Dr. Andrew Hill is on the podcast today, and uh, we were talking before the podcast started. I didn't want to talk to you anymore. I wanted to get you in here and sit you down. Because you, you said something really fascinating that you take people who may have problems with substances mm -hmm. and you instead of getting them to abstain you get them to use them responsibly which is yeah. an alien concept in this day and age yeah i mean this is not terribly common in substance abuse you know sort of treatment world uh, there's a few companies that do it and one of them is here in los angeles alternatives and we uh will take people that you know might have an issue with alcohol let's say and uh, the only, only option is not abstinence for our program. We have moderation options, controlled use options, harm reduction. So someone might come in and say, you know, look, I'm a, uh, I, I consider myself an alcoholic, but I want to start drinking again. Or, <laughs> you know, I'm someone who has been abstinent for a long time and struggles with craving, struggles with, you know, choice. And whenever I slip, I slip big. Help me figure out how to not be that guy, how to use responsibly or to not use. So we don't necessarily say you must be a moderate user or you must abstain. We ask clients what they want to do and then help them figure out how to get there. And for many of them, they come to us because we do offer a moderation, moderate alcohol use approach. That is, uh, that seems pretty novel. Is, is it? I mean, it is pretty novel, yeah. One of our principals, Dr. Mark Kern, uh, has been doing addiction work with moderation focus for about 30 years uh, in L.A., and so it's not just, you know, the newest thing ever, but it's newer than AA, of course, which has been around for you know, pushing 100 years now. Yeah, AA people seem to think that that's the only way to go. You have to do the 12-step step program. Yeah. You have to call everybody you ever wronged. You have right. to pray to Jesus. You have to... Yep. Drink a lot of coffee and smoke cigarettes. Yeah, think, it's, it's, part it's part of it. Part, it must be. It must be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, the biggest difference uh, for an alternatives approach or a harm reduction or moderation approach compared to AA, in, in my perspective, is that a lot of the AA approach is disempowering. You must give up control, uh, you know, surrender. Surrender. Um, and I think that there's another option out there, and that's architecting more control, more power. Let's figure out your cues for over drinking. Let's figure out what happens, you know, why do you get to five or six or seven drinks? Like what happens on drink two? Um, you know, what are the triggers for like going home and, you know, automatically driving into that liquor store parking lot you always pass by. So we help people figure out all the different triggers and cues that are driving their out of control use and what control use might look like for them, you know, what sort of appropriate mindful drinking might look like for them. Um, and it's, if it's alcohol, people spend uh, the first month with us abstaining anyways, just to reset tolerance. Because uh, to be good at moderation, you have to be good at abstinence. So the goals may not be abstinence always in our alcohol program, but everyone takes a month off, resets their tolerance, you know, gets some sort of clear head, uh, gets their sleep fixed. Um, and we're doing other things besides the alcohol uh, interventions, doing therapy and biofeedback and mindfulness and, th and other, you know, sort of whole team approach. But then at the end of that month, if folks decide they want to, we go to a bar with them, Whoa. sit down, they order a drink, uh, we give them a breathalyzer and they have their first drink and we, you know, they get breathalyzed every... Do you drink with them? Um, not at this, no, no. Uh, Later? Um, you know, I, I don't typically go to the bars with our clients. Um, there's, there, there's some legal issues with drinking with them. Like when we go to a bar with them, we buy lunch and they buy the alcohol. Uh, to avoid. Oh, so you can't even buy it. They we don't provide the drugs and alcohol. Yeah, of course. So do they drink by themselves? Sometimes. Um, a lot of the clients that uh, we work with carry around little breathalyzers in their pocket that several times a day ping them and ask them to blow and get a little uh, camera snapshot. And, you know, it, it is them and a GPS location. Wow. And so we determine where they are, who they are, and what their blood alcohol is. And, you know, unlike most other treatment programs, if you blow dirty on a breathalyzer, it's usually like, you're out of here. Mm -hmm. With us, it's like, oh, great. So you drank. What was that like? I see you got this blood alcohol level. Um, how many drinks was that? Was that two? Okay, interesting. How, over what time frame? How did that feel? And we get people to, in a very structured way, analyze what alcohol is instead of it being sort of momentum, uh, you know, based behavior. 
the, the the there's a certain amount of like pull that something has a draw and attracted mm-hmm. uh, like an, an, an energy to something that's forbidden yeah and that that is very problematic for people that are addicts yeah I, I've seen it firsthand many times where people just have this overwhelming desire to do what they're not supposed to do almost because it's like the pressure of abstaining yeah. is just overwhelming it's like that 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 issue oh is always a cloud hovering over them yeah also things that are forbidden become attractive yeah. and the conversation about them gets shut down a little bit when things get sort of you know put in these little isolated bulwarks of um, dangerous and forbidden right so it's hard to talk about you know problematic alcohol use if any alcohol use is considered problematic yeah it, it becomes one of those things where it, it, it everyone has this very rigid idea of what an alcoholic is supposed to do mm-hmm. and if you bring up something like what you're proposing or what you actually not, not just propose but you, you enact in treatment that's got to receive a lot of criticism it does and you know we get long-term sort of 12-step type saying you're going to kill people people are going to you know mm-hmm. have problems the thing is you know we've done some research in our center and folks self-select abstinent track or moderation track and the self-selection appears to be what drives success not which track you're on so if people identify their goals we help them reach those goals but if your only goals are or if your only allowable path is you must be abstinent then you aren't taught any skills about how to drink a little bit you know, so when people who are on an abstinence only sort of treatment programs have slips, they have big slips. They just say, okay, I'm off the track. Yeah. Ooh, let's just pound it back. And there, there's myself. that. There's that discounting. Oh, you know, oh, I've screwed up once. Might as well just go for it. And there's also the piece about skills. We have, they don't know how to drink two or three or four drinks if all they do is abstain. Now, now, the common thought on genetics and addiction is that certain people have just a predisposition for alcoholism, for drug addiction. Mm-hmm. Is that a fact? Yeah, there's a, um, an opioid receptor in the brain. Um, I forget if it's the mu or the kappa, but one of the opioid receptors in the brain, uh, there's one genetic sort of flavor you can have where alcohol is extra rewarding. Mm. Where it just, you, know, you, you love that sensation, you love the feeling a little more than the average person might. So, but is it just that? Is it just they love it more? Well, it's it's more rewarding, and therefore learning is reinforced. I mean, rewarding mm-hmm. meaning that what, what you find appetitive or interesting or yummy. Um, if you find things extra yummy, then your behavior is modified to get more of that thing. You know, B- right? But I, the way I've always thought of it, I don't have a genetic predisposition to alcoholism, mm-hmm. and I've had friends who do. Yeah, and there's this weird thing that happens to them when you see them drink, where they they go gerbilize, you know, where they're like, no one's there. They yeah. have shark eyes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, you're looking at them, you're like, where are you, man? Are right. you in there? Like, you, you literally don't see them anymore. Well, these folks are probably, you know, thoroughly into a hardcore drinking, you know, lifestyle, right? This is not their first big slip in a long time. This is sort of a, uh, you know, go to the bar after work every day or go to the liquor store and grab a half bottle of wine every day. This is, you know, reinforced behavior. Um, I don't think even someone with those genes would have sort of a checkout or some, you know, lack of sudden self-control their first drink after abstaining for a while. It's the the behavioral sort of slippery slope that we get on that causes the problem. And folks that have this extra rewarding effect from alcohol, you know, get pulled down that slope faster. But it's still not, you know, predetermined. You're not going to become an alcoholic just because you have a more rewarding effect from alcohol or something else. See, I was always confused. I didn't think that it was a reward issue. I I thought, and this is based entirely on, you know, just talking to people. There's no no research, obviously. But I always thought it was just something happens to them where they cannot help themselves. That's, is that just the common way of discussing it because of the the 12-step treatment program ideal? Yeah, I think partially there's this idea of, well, you're powerless over alcohol, therefore yeah. accept that you're powerless. Um, but a lot of that powerlessness or I can't control my behavior is because of the sort of overlearning that comes where behavior is no longer choice. It's almost automatic because you've gotten so rewarded so many times from that behavior that then the behavior becomes reinforced. I mean, it, you know, all addiction is this way, but all addiction is just learning. It's not some special form of learning. It's just learning. So what you're talking about is people that have learned to lose control. So does that like, there's 
the common thought about Native Americans, mm. the, the common um, uh, discussion when people talk about Native Americans and alcohol mm -hmm. is that they didn't have alcohol in their diet. We introduced it to them with the Europeans rather sure. introduced it to them. And then they became almost instantly addicted because they did not have the genetic predisposition to process it. Yeah. And is that's that BS. Um, I think it's partially BS. I think it's more about, you know, if you lock a bunch of people on a small plot of uh, non farmable land and don't give them any mechanisms for advancement and take away all their power and then give them a drug to abuse, they abuse it. You know, there's all these studies showing that if you give a, a rat unfettered access to drugs and alcohol, it sits there and, you know, mm -hmm. hits the lever until it dies, right? That's actually not true. If you give a rat access to cocaine or alcohol, well, probably not alcohol, but something really rewarding, um, it will only self-administer the drug in the, you know, and, and sort of starve to death for the reward when the environment isn't interesting, mm. and when the environment's right. impoverished. If there's lots of you know, rat toys and lots of other cute rats hanging out, they're much less interested in becoming cocaine addicts or whatever it is. Um, it's only in the absence of stimulating enriched environments do these sort of automatic behaviors take over. So I would argue, at least partially, the Native American alcohol connection is because these are disen people who are disenfranchised systematically and then given an escape. Uh, yeah, I had that discussion recently with Dr. Chris Ryan, and one of the things, he's uh, the author of uh, Sex at Dawn, mm -hmm. a very interesting book, but one of the things that he brought up is the environment itself that they do these study studies on rats, they're in a cage. Yeah. They're in a cage, there's fluorescent lights, and there's people in lab coats that are hovering over them. Right. It's about as unnatural as you can get, yep. and any escape that they could probably seek you know, to, to, to try exactly. to mitigate yeah. the stress that they're under. Yep. I mean, it's a completely unnatural environment. It's not like you're giving them cocaine out in the wild. Right. And if you did exactly. do that, they probably wouldn't. They would. probably wouldn't go after it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, if you put some toys in their cage, they stop self-administering to the same degree. Right. They're just not as interested in, I mean, addiction is not the goal. The reward is not necessarily the goal when things are interesting, novel, when you can explore your environments. Right. So their brains are programmed to seek out food, to seek out sex yep. and to seek out shelter. And when all those things are screwed up because they're in this completely unnatural environment, they, they don't know what to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and, and this, this is not just rats. I mean, humans are given this, well, if you're an alcoholic, if you're a drinker, a problem drinker, you're always going to be a problem drinker is the prevailing wisdom, which also isn't true. Something like 90, 95% of people that are problem drinkers learn to not be problem drinkers with no programs, with no intervention, no therapy, it's learn to get control over their drinking. Do you think that that, well, that's a really interesting point. It's a really interesting point when you think about um, people that look forward to happy hour. They mm -hmm. look forward to that drink after work. Like how many boring jobs have turned people into alcoholics because yeah. while they're at work all day, they're just constantly itching away at their natural reward systems. Just, God, something, I gotta get something in here. Exactly, yeah, and, and boredom uh, and lack of ability to tolerate boredom or tolerate uncomfortable emotions of which, you know, boredom can be one, is often the biggest driver for problematic substance use. Oh, wow, boredom. Boredom or- Marriage. <laughs> That's why dudes get drunk when they're married. Well, it's probably one of the reasons. It's a big one, right? Yeah. That is amazing that, you know, and it's that, that story has always been that story of the tests with the the rats and the cocaine yeah has been just sort of repeated ad nauseum sure and to the point where everybody repeats it and until chris ryan brought it up that way i i, I never really thought about it i just thought wow cocaine is just super addictive and then he, he brought it up that way i'm like oh yeah of course they're in a fucking cage right you know what they're all stressed out freaked out no wonder why they're doing blow yeah exactly right and you know and things like cocaine math um the psychostimulant class of drugs um they affect a neurotransmitter primarily called dopamine and dopamine is the reward signal. It's the interest, salience, appetitive. You know, when you see a hot girl, you get a dopamine bump. When you eat an ice cream sandwich, you get a dopamine bump. When you do a line of blow, you get a dopamine bump. And a second one from the direct, you know, cocaine affecting the dopamine system. So the stimulant class is sort of so addictive because it's pleasurable and because it directly modifies the dopamine sort of system. So you get a one, two, almost a double uh, reward, if you will. And do you apply the same sort of treatment 
protocol with cocaine that you do with alcohol? We don't, no. Um, you know, there's a bunch of reasons why. Uh, for things that are sort of drugs of abuse, like cocaine, meth, you know, we would probably ask folks to abstain or encourage them to. But there's some other drugs you can't abstain from. You know, someone's on, like, drugs for pain, medica uh, pain management or psychiatric drugs they need to take for whatever reason. Um, we would do a more harm reduction approach for drugs prescribed drugs that have become a drugs of abuse. But for recreational drugs of abuse, like cocaine, um, you know, there's, there's legal uh, and ethical issues with offering uh, moderate cocaine use. Well, what if cocaine was legal? Then we would. Then you would. Like canna so it's cannabis, for instance, is sort of right on that edge of, uh, you know, being legal or not. And, mm -hmm. and we would offer uh, cannabis moderation if someone was legally using cannabis, you know. Um, and if we were in Colorado or Washington State, we'd be offering cannabis as an equal moderate player, so to speak, with our alcohol program. Well, does that concern you that the only reason why you don't use cocaine in that way is that it's illegal? Well, I mean, I think a lot of people can get in trouble with cocaine. Um, in a way they aren't going to get in trouble with weed. So I think the bar for risk versus harm versus, you know, what we're, we're uh, potentially the, the, the cost of failure is much higher for some of these heavier drugs. Right. So we're never going to offer like a heroin moderation program. But isn't you know? alcohol equally bad for you? I mean, uh, when you look at statistics of abuse and the, the health consequences, alcohol seems to rank right up there with heroin. There are more alcohol abusers. Is that what it is? Then there are heroin abusers. Okay. And that people don't, don't abuse heroin from like you know, age 12 to age 80 right. at high levels. I mean, we, people can abuse alcohol their whole lives at high level. Um, and survive. And somehow survive or somehow or you know, manage. That's not going to be the, the case with cocaine or heroin or you know, major opiates or stimulants. Now, when you talk about opiates, of course, in this country and today, you, you consider pills yeah. because this is the new form of distribution. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that um, the documentary, um, uh, the OxyContin Express? I have not. It is a really fascinating piece that they did, and it actually helped alter the law in Florida. Because Florida used to have those, you're aware mm -hmm. of the whole situation in Florida. Sure. They had pain management centers, for folks who don't know. And these pain, pain management centers were essentially one-stop heroin shops. Yeah. They'd give it to you in pill form, but you would go there, there would be a doctor right there. And you'd say, hey, doctor, my back's all fucked up. All right, well, you need pain pills. And then you would go, literally, you would exit his door and go to the next door, and that was run by the same company, yeah. and it was a pain management facility pharmacy. Yeah. And you'd go in there, and all they had was pills. And you would just go and buy Oxycontins. And there was all these people waiting outside. Vanguard did the show uh, on it. And uh, it was amazing. It was amazing because they, they followed people who were hooked on it. Mm -hmm. They followed people that were going hopping from clinic to clinic. And it was mm -hmm. just rampant. Florida had some ungodly percentage of people that were prescribed uh, Oxycontins. Like now, of course, elders more. are also, I mean, Florida, half the state is elders. Mm -hmm. And pain management is much you know more common pain management in, in the medical sort of space is much more common when you're you know 70 80 years old than it is when you're 30 or 40 it's very important when you say elders that you say age and not Mormons yes people yes um, uh, not the <laughs> not not the quorum of 12 or whatever no uh, like like people 60 65 and up is what I consider elders yeah. I have some friends that are Mormon and we, we were over their house and some elders came over and they were in their 20s yeah there, there, there. This is Elder John. And this is Elder Wilson. Yeah. Like, get the fuck out of here! I'm not calling you Elder. Yeah, I have a buddy who's a who's a Jack Mormon, you know, a lapsed Mormon, and uh, he's this you know 55 year old guy with dreadlocks down to his ankles, and you know, musician, and he he left the Mormon Church, but he was an elder in his like early 20s uh, before he sort of uh, decided it wasn't for him. Yeah, he could have used some heroin. Yeah, you know, got maybe. him off that early, maybe. Um, so you think that if more people had heroin, you would see health consequences um, far worse than what they are of alcohol? I do. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it'd be hard for people to abuse high levels of opiates without their life falling apart very quickly. And this is. I mean, some people get into alcohol and go downhill very fast. Mm -hmm. Other people get into alcohol and never have a problem with it, even drinking high levels. Well, what concerns me about uh, those pills more than anything else is I've had friends that don't have problems with anything else. Yeah. And they got on pain pills and then yep. boom. Yep. Including, uh, uh, there's a family member that I have who just got, got injured at work, mm -hmm. got on pills for his back, yeah. and then gone. Really common story. 
it's bizarre. It's yeah. like something steals who they are. Yeah, and once you're addicted to you know pain medication, you know the doctors won't give it to you forever. So at some point you're getting off the pain medication prescriptions, but you might still be addicted. So you seek, you know, street opiates, mm -hmm. and that's sort, yeah. of the, sort of the standard story there. So there's an itch that they can't scratch anymore, and it just becomes overwhelming after yeah. a while. Yeah, exactly. That, and is is a lot of that the same thing? Sort of this psychological pull of something that's forbidden or something that you're not supposed to do, or is there is a, a physical component to the heroin There's definitely addiction? a physical component uh, to addictions, um, but you know the withdrawal symptoms and the I mean addiction is really two things: it's dependence and tolerance. Um, and the tolerance you can get for some drugs very quickly. The dependence might not show up the same way for everybody. Um, but other folks may have dependence, you know, meaning withdrawal symptoms from low uh, amounts. Heroin is fairly addicting. The withdrawal from heroin is brutal. I believe the physiological addiction of nicotine might be greater than heroin, but the withdrawal is not as bad. So the physical withdrawal, the yeah. actual b aches of your body. Yeah. Carl Hart described, Dr. Carl Hart, um, I forget the name of his book, but he's been on the podcast before. You remember his book, Jamie? Doesn't matter. It's not important. Um, he said it was like having a bad flu. He said it's, yeah, it's dope very... Sick. Yeah, dope sick. Yeah. He yeah. said it's very overrated as far as the amount of pain you go through. I mean, the flu kind of sucks. It does kind of suck, but... Everyone looks at it as if like it's this horrible bone aching. Like I've never done oxycontin, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I don't. I don't know. I've never done heroin, so I. I, I I'm just guessing. Well, think about what the opiate system does uh, endogenously, naturally in your body. It helps you not feel pain. It helps reduce pain and inflammation. So if you've been abusing with supra physiological levels, massive opiates, and then you withdraw them, your pain reduction system is overly sort of, you know, sensitized, and then you feel things as painful that were not considered painful before. So I think that a lot of the withdrawal is sort of resetting the opiate, the endogenous pain management system. Mm, interesting. So there's probably all sorts of weird little aches and pains that you are, already have that you're just completely unaware of, and then they yeah. glaringly become obvious. Which is what happens when you get the flu, and you, if you worked out the day before, you feel like crap. You know, muscles are extra achy because now there's inflammation and, you know, spasms. And I think all that probably happens, too, when you're withdrawing from massive opiates. Now, when you get a guy like uh, Rush Limbaugh, who famously was taking something like 90 pills a day, something insane, yeah. I don't remember what the number was, but it was off the charts where he had his housekeeper would go out and buy him the stuff. Yeah. And how does that happen? Like, how does one keep ramping it up? Well, I mean, I think you have to be resourceful. And I think you mentioned earlier people, you know, clinic hopping or doctor hopping. I mean, that's a really common sort of way people abuse uh, pain meds is they get multiple people to prescribe. Um, and it sounds like, you know, Rush may have had his uh, friends and family, you know, helping to develop his habit. Um, when you're taking lots of different things, though, there's an added risk, and that's of what's called polypharmacy or interactions between your drugs. And a lot of painkillers, a lot of major tranquilizers are very significant drugs that suppress the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system. And so if you combine different types of drugs being given from different doctors who aren't aware of the different drugs that you're being given, mm. then you can get into you know, life-threatening side effects very quickly for some people. That was the big issue in Florida was that they didn't have a database up yeah. until recently. So you could go to one doctor, get your prescription, and yep. go right down the street to another doctor, and they couldn't share information. So you'd never know, hey, this right. guy already has a prescription. He's going crazy, and he's getting pills all exactly. over town. Yeah, and you know, to some extent, those little uh, pharmacy slash prescription shops, uh, they, they remind me of you know the, the uh, cannabis culture we have in most states now where you know you can walk into a little mom and pop sort of prescription center where you maybe you see a doctor maybe you see their nurse practitioner you pay your 40 bucks you walk out with a card you go next door and you put your card down and walk out with your weed you know mm -hmm. nowadays you go online and you say i'd like this strain delivered at my door at this time and it shows up at your door with a smile and a you know a little mint um, yeah it's a very different uh sort of way to deal with drugs than 
the gatekeeper of the physician who's carefully paying attention to your full use spectrum and managing your life, managing your health with some you know, good perspective on you. When we have these, you know, as you mentioned, the, the short time, uh, we have 10 minutes with a doctor or something and it's a prescription out the door. Yeah, well, the cannabis one is kind of a joke because although there are people, I mean, I know people that use it for health reasons, the vast majority are juking the system. They're just like, hey, uh, um, I got a headache, you know, sure. well, you know getting um, free pot. Or stress, stress is one of the biggest de detriments to health. You know, cortisol rises, your, your hippocampus dies, and cells fall apart, and your body heals less fast, and you learn less well. Your frontal lobe shuts down. Stress is a big problem. So, you know, I, I would argue that even the recreational cannabis users who sort of gamed the system are getting the stress reduction benefits from it typically. Oh, no, I would agree with you, most certainly. I also think that life itself uh, is a disease and uh -huh. that you need a drug to treat life itself. Yeah, maybe it's, a desirable difficulty. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. The, well, the, the, the pressures of the average nine to five existence plus traffic, commute, bills, mm -hmm. family is mm -hmm. overwhelming. I don't, I don't believe that our bodies are designed for this. And I think yeah. that any means that you can without completely destroying your body and mitigating whatever pressures mm -hmm. and stresses you're under, I'm all for it. I mean, I think aspirin should be legal. Yep. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of almost everything being legal, sure. but I think that some folks uh, are going to have a much harder time with certain substances than others. Yeah, and that's individual variability as part of it, you know, the genetics you show up with. It's also things like your, your environment, you know, what you see used, how you use, why you use. You know, are you using because you want to feel comfortable or euphoric or have some good time or watch a movie and find it extra interesting? are using to shut down the pain and boredom of your life. Right. Those are very dramatically different ways of using substances. And are you using it to mitigate the effects of trauma, especially yes. trauma from your childhood, yep. which is one of the things that people don't consider when they talk in disparaging ways about people being addicts. Yeah. They don't consider the fact that this person might have been wired in a certain way because of traumatic experiences sure. that they had while they're developing, where their mind was developing. Yep. I their see that all the time. genes represent that. Yeah, I mean, I, I do brain mapping QEEG, and we look at sort of functional patterns in brains and try to tie it together to people's you know, behavior and the things they're struggling with. And I often see in people that are struggling with alcohol sort of a sensitization, a hot spot on the back of the brain in an area called the posterior cingulate cortex cortex, which is to some extent involved with like sensitization to threat, noticing danger. And these, that, 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 that spot shows up, that overactivity shows up when people have experienced fairly significant trauma. Um, so it's a pretty common reason people are using drugs and alcohol. Is there a way to mitigate that? Is there a way to diminish the effects of... Um... Oh, sure. Yeah, there's multiple ways. It's a short answer. Um, I, I do a lot of neurofeedback or biofeedback on brain waves. So you might measure that like excess beta, excess fast activity back there. It's not a stuck level. It's, it's always fluctuating moment to moment. And so whenever it trends in the right direction, goes down, you make something happen. Make a chime play or a spaceship fly or a Pac-Man eat some dots but it fluctuates in the wrong direction a minute later and the Pac-Man stops. And then the brain fluctuates in the right direction, the Pac-Man continues. The brain starts to go, oh cool, input whenever I'm doing one thing, and so it does more of that one thing. And this trains down or trains up certain patterns in the brain to change regulatory modes. Wow, so what's the mechanism of this? Like, what's causing this? Yeah, well, it's basic learning. I mean, when you were a baby flopping around trying to learn how to walk, there was a lot of random activity making your limbs move, or semi-random, you know, just trying random. Your brain was just sending out, sending out random pulses to see what happened. And, and suddenly you put your arms down on the, the ground, you push yourself up, and you could see more. You could see, you know, further than the distance. And your brain went, oh, cool. Remember this pattern of muscle activity because this one gets me to, you know, see more stuff and explore the environment. And it wasn't like some magical, your brain went, okay, you know, contract the left bicep and then the left forearm. It just kind of happens randomly until it produces the desired effect, which is, oh, I'm sort of crawling now. And then the brain does more of the thing that let it get more input, you know, avoid danger, get pleasure, whatever the you know, learning reinforcers are. The same thing happens when you're sitting in front of a biofeedback machine, trying to make a spaceship fly or a car race around a track with your brain. Um, you want it to happen, and so whenever the car you know, slows down and peters out next to the race course because your brain got distracted or tense, the brain doesn't like the lack of input. And it starts to go, hey, wait, where's my, where's my input? And it tries to figure out, oh, I'm controlling this environment out in the world, therefore I should do more of X, less of Y. It's, it's, a, it's actually a non-cognitive process. 
believe it or not. You aren't trying. You're more sort of letting it happen. We're instrumentally are shaping, conditioning the brain in certain directions. And there are there certain triggers that could potentially bring you back to the negative state that you were in because of the trauma? Like, are there things that people have to avoid once they go through this process to keep from For biofeedback, not, not generally. The neurofeedback or biofeedback process is typically changing the brain and changing it permanently. Permanently. It's kind of wow. like if you, know, if you were limping because your left knee was off and you went to do six months of physical, physical therapy, from then on you're walking with appropriate gait and you're always practicing the new muscles and coordination and things. So uh, neurofeedback isn't permanent for everything. There's an active disease process going on, like schizophrenia or HIV or something. Then the problems you're able to reduce can reemerge. But if you've got like ADHD or migraines or sleep issues or anxiety or trauma or OCD or PTSD or, you know, these things all do appear to change and change in a largely permanent way for most people. Wow, that's amazing. That's incredible. And how long is this process? Like, say, if you take someone yeah. who's had a traumatic childhood and issues with abuse and substance abuse because of that, yep. and then they enter into some sort of a treatment like this, how, how long of a process? Is yeah, most that? of my clients um, start off with um, it's sort of a training program. It's like going to the gym. If you go to the gym once every so often, it doesn't do much. So I ask my clients to come in two or three times a week for about 30 sessions total. And that's enough, 30 sessions is enough typically to make one and a half to two standard deviations of change, pretty big change. So it can take a dramatically ADHD person and give them control over their attention management. It can re-regulate sleep, eliminate migraines. So 30 sessions is my answer to that question of, well, how long does it take? 30 sessions, that seems really small. You know, three, four times a week, you might get it done in, uh, you know, six, seven, eight weeks. That's, that's to, to change to the To eliminate your ADHD, your anxiety, your that's trauma. That's incredible. Yeah. Now, what is ADHD? What, what exactly is it? Because you hear people saying that it doesn't exist. You hear people saying that it's just some way yeah. that they diagnose children so they can give them medication. There's some truth to that. And there's some truth to the, to the people saying it doesn't exist. Um, I think that as a pathology, as a strictly a mental illness, it doesn't really exist. I think it doesn't what, exist. I think what we have is a natural spectrum, continuum of attention management resources. And some of us can notice everything in the environment and turn our attention and just be wide focused and be pulled off by all novelty. And other folks are good at being heads down and sustained attention. You know, 10,000 years ago, we needed hunters who could like, you know, see the little, the little tiger hiding in the corner or the hard, you know, red berry, hard, hard to spot piece of fruit hiding under the leaf who could notice all the little environmental cues. And we also needed folks who could sit behind the village and like weed the plants all day long. So I think that there's a natural sort of reinforcer of human, you know, a range of human attention regulation where some folks have more novelty seeking, more wide focus, and other folks have more narrow or sustained attention. So when we say ADHD, you know, the, the, the diagnostic criteria uh, in general in mental health isn't really about what's going on. It's about what's going on and does it interfere with your life. So um, you can be really hyperactive, really spacey, really checked out, really you know, hard to talk to. But if you're successful, I wouldn't call it a pathology. I wouldn't even call it ADHD. Um, and to call it ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, the deficit is, you know, implies you have less attention than average. But you know, we all know ADHD people that can sit and play video games without stopping for 20 hours straight. That's not a deficit of attention. That's a, an excess of typical attention to some extent. So it's really about managing your attention in ways that are appropriate to the demands of the environment. If your classroom teacher wants you to sit still for 45 minutes and you can't, then it's a problem. It becomes a problem because of the classroom, though, doesn't it? And if you Maybe. have a, someone who has this issue with attention when it comes to things that they're not into, but yet they can focus extremely well on something yeah. that they're fascinated by, and then that benefits them and they become successful at yep. that. If you are in a negative environment as far as teaching or school, and they try to get you to become this person who's just like everybody yeah. else, then it becomes something they want to medicate you with. Right. And but they and, could be yeah. medicating away, medicating away something that makes you unique and could actually benefit you in your life. Absolutely. And there are benefits for having, you know, more abstract thought and more novelty seeking and be able to integrate, you know, abstract concepts. Especially for artists. Especially for artists, especially people that aren't, you know, like I'm, I'm for instance, horrible at math. I cannot do math in my head. I'm dyscalculic. But I'm verbally about as you know, good as it gets. 
And so, you know, I was always sort of not rewarded by being in math classes and really rewarded being in, you know, language or, you know, whatever, English class. Um, the artist ADHD kid thrives in, you know, one-tenth of their high school classes, um, potentially, if it's dramatic ADHD. But, you know, I would say that most people don't have dramatic attention regulation issues. They have minor attention regulation issues that can be changed. Um, you mentioned that uh, ADHD people can be uh, fascinated with it, by things and really, you know, pay attention. Um, the prefrontal cortex, the most most frontal, most anterior part of the brain, the most human part, the, mo the part that developed uh, the latest, is really the executive of the brain, the CEO. And a lot of how it does its job is by telling the rest of the brain, no, you know, don't turn your head and look at this other thing, don't you know, grab that woman, don't eat that food, don't, you know, it's no, 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 is a lot of what the PFC does. In ADHD, the PFC is often underactive. It's kind of like the CEO is asleep at the wheel. And so other parts of the brain kind of take over. It's like the sensory system sees a pretty bird fly by and turns your head before you know it, because the CEO is not telling you not to. Um, this is why uh, ADHD folks tend to really pursue activities that are dangerous. You know, well, skydiving, motorcycle riding, taking drugs, risky sex, because anything risky, challenging, dangerous lights up the PFC and really turns it on and, and activates it in a way that most ADHD people don't experience most of the time. This is why uh, if you have an ADHD kid, they train parents to yell at them to create the conflict that then produces a more active prefrontal cortex. They train parents to yell at them. Yeah, without even knowing it. They, 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 they train people around them to create conflict with them because being yelled at, being punished, being you know, engaged aggressively lights up the prefrontal cortex. So they do behavior or they engage in behavior that will cause people to yell at them subconsciously. To get the reward of having a feeling alive, a feeling on. Whoa. Whoa. That's freaky. Now, when you're dealing with people that have such an incredible amount of variation, yeah. the variation between human beings and personalities, and, and you're, Huge. St you're sticking them in a classroom, mm -hmm. and you're forcing them to adhere to uh, some sort of a program that was designed by someone who's never going to meet them, yeah. and it's the same for everyone ac across the like state. Like Common or, Core yeah. or something, yeah. Something along those lines. How damaging is that for someone's education? I mean, it seems to me that, like, it just seems that that sort of pressure to conform yeah. is going to be met with resistance. Yeah, right? and of course it will. And, and the more unusual the, you are, the harder it will be to conform. But I would say for most people, you're still getting basic skills, even in these sort of homogenized programs. And is there some benefit from just dealing with this homogenization and dealing with the boarding, mm -hmm. b the curriculum, b you know, that they're forcing upon you, just to get, you know, just some, some sort, of, sort of stress management benefits? I mean, you know, it's certainly people management. You can't teach every individual kid one-on-one. -on -one. Um, right. And so there has to be an accommodation or a you know, compromise somewhere for doing classroom, you know, public school, you know, broad teaching. Um, I think technology is changing that. I think the massively online, you know, courses that are mostly free these days, um, that's mostly adults taking those and you know, taking, taking advantage of those. But I think that will change how we teach children long term. It will allow more individualized. You know, if you take the so traditional public school common core system on one end of the spectrum and you look at something completely opposite like uh, Montessori. Uh, schools. Montessori is all about finding the thing the kid is interested in mm -hmm. and then funneling all their learning down that one avenue of interest. I love the idea behind that, but Montessori also lumps all these ages together and you get a lot of weird social shit goes on when you have a 12 year old with a six year old. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, but that's also a little bit more. I mean, I'm not sure that we need to segregate ages. Uh, you know, we, we create cohort effects, people experience specific things because of the groups they're lumped in with. Mm -hmm. That's a little artificial. You know, a couple hundred years ago, we had a six year old and a 12 year old and a 16 year old in the same classroom. And they probably all learned from each other, even if they didn't know it. Right, but aren't they all on different levels? A six-year-old and a 12-year-old are going to be learning completely different Maybe, things. Maybe, but at six years old, I was learning like most 16-year-olds. Well, you're a super genius, dude. Well, you know, hey, thanks. But, uh, <laughs> but the point is that even within all a bunch of six-year-olds, you know, class of, what is that, like th third grade or something, uh -huh. um, 
you know, you've got some that are functioning several years below their level and some that are functioning many years above their level. The first intelligence tests were really age norm tests. They said, you know, here you're functioning compared to your chronological age, where's your mental age? Um, that was the first sort of round of intelligence tests that were created. Um, it was all about age, you know, developmental age versus chronological age. But it would seem to me that it would be incredibly different. I'm not that aware of the Montessori system other than friends that have kids sure. in it that have complaints. But I would think that the the variability would be so large that if you have a classroom of 20, 30 kids, mm -hmm. how are you going to pay attention to each kid's needs? You're going to have to yeah. have multiple teachers. You do. And, and in Montessori, you tend to have smaller classroom sizes with, m with more teachers, teacher's aides, Montessori assistants. You know, in a public school, you might have one teacher for 35 kids, if you're lucky. If you're lucky. And in a Montessori program with 25 or 30 kids, you probably have four or five adults in the room. Knowing what you know about the mind and the development of the mind, is the current state of education, public education in this country, is that one of the more frustrating things that you have to consider? Not, not really. I mean, people learn so many different ways, and I also don't think that learning stops when you're out of school. So I think that the, the role of public education should be to do as much as possible for as many people as possible. But, you know, the people at either of the extremes are never going to be well served. People that are struggling or people that are advanced are never going to be well served by you know, general public education while it's this sort of 1 to 35, 1 to 40 ratio. Right, but that was the point. Why is it 1 to 35, 1 to 40? And why does it receive such poor funding? And why do teachers receive yeah. such little respect? I mean, I'm a teacher. I teach at UCLA. And, uh, you know, we get paid adequately as a lecturer. It's a college. It's a college. Um, but even at that level, you know, the pay is not all that dramatically amazing. Um, I feel like, you know, like maybe you're implying that we should be paying people shaping our young people's minds uh, a lot and, and well, treasuring their roles. Yeah, it should be a huge honor. Yeah, um, we don't have that. We don't tend to have a lot of traditional mechanisms left in our sort of modern Western culture. We don't look at, um, you know, coming of age or differences. I mean, women have an obvious coming of age thing that happens between like 9 and 13 there's a physiologic change so it's obvious boys don't have that and so you know thousand years ago when we hit 13 years old we were you know made men with some ritual and we don't mm -hmm. you know hunted a boar who knows um, got a tattoo uh, but nowadays people go from you know being children to adults without any clear stages without the sort of social reinforcers of, of where you are and what your life means in terms of the community in terms of your family so I think that's, unfortunately, you know, it's a function of living on a planet with 7 billion people. That's uh, a topic that's been brought up on this show many, many times, because I'm, I'm a big fan of and a big proponent of engaging in difficult activities to f understand yourself. Uh -huh. And I think that coming-of-age rituals, they, at, at the very least, signify to a child, like, now I am this. Yeah. In martial arts, you get belts. Yep. And, you know, when you re achieve, you know, your blue belt, there's this moment where you get that belt, you go, wow, yeah. I am a blue belt now. And it doesn't seem like it should be much, but I remember when I was doing jujitsu and I went from a white belt to a blue belt, I was like, wow. I got my blue belt. Yeah. Now. But meanwhile, yeah. I was the exact same person. Nothing had changed. But other you were than the recognized ritual. as different. And in and in in historical cultural sort of coming of age rituals, the young person is given advice by all the men in the village, all the women in the village. They pick a new name sometimes. They go through like an ordeal. I mean, the, the ordeal I think is what you're talking about too. Yes. The, the ordeal is should not be underestimated. I I don't know if uh, we haven't met before, so I have a history as a ecstatic shaman. I've done a lot of ecstatic work around. What does that mean? An ecstatic pushing shaman. yourself hard until your reality changes. Uh, Mercedes Eliade, the sort of uh, guy who defined shamanism, defined it as you know, ordinary reality is what we all have. And if you push yourself hard enough through any mechanism you can think of, eventually your reality breaks and you have other insight, other knowledge, other ways of you know, understanding the world. And so for me, it's been things like you know, dance all night long or drumming or you know, other, other things as well. But the idea is to push yourself until you get out of your own way until your monkey mind breaks down, until you leave that behind. So as a shaman, you would lead people in these 
dance marathons? Sure, or just do it myself. I mean, I'm, I'm a West African drummer as well, so I'm often what like... What does that mean? It means I, I, I drum for dance classes. I drum for, you know, people dancing all night long around a fire until they until they flop on the ground speaking in tongues. Whoa. Um, the idea is to, is to give yourself a chance so you can change your reality. So you're looking at this, though, from the point of view of a neuroscientist yeah. instead of... A crazy hippie. Well, I was a crazy hippie before I was a neuroscientist. Ah. You, know, you can't tell, but I have about as much ink as you do, um, and so I have a. How could that be possible when I see your forearms? Well, you know, it's it's all it's all, it's all uh, over your back yeah, and chest. It, exactly. What do you got? Like flowers and no, it's all Celtic. Trucking. It's all Celtic and really, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I, I I grew up as like a uh, on the East Coast as a hard nosed you know East Coaster, and I did the, found this world of being a you know sort of shaman, if you will. I'm also a motorcyclist, so I have a you know dr ride cross country and do a lot of long road trips. But yeah, I also put a nice dress shirt on and go and you know do science too. So you you walk in and out of many worlds. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to do that to not hold any identity too rigorously. What is your opinion of Ibogaine? Um, I don't know enough about it is the short answer. Uh, I think it's interesting. Um, uh, I'm intrigued by it. And I think for folks that are struggling with certain types of drug addiction, uh, I, mean, I have some clients who've gone through that particular thing and say that they're, you know, they were impressed by it or they, they got something out of it. I just don't have enough you know, real clear firsthand experience to talk the about. The amount of people that have done it, I've never done it either, but mm -hmm. the amount of people that have done it that have had uh, addiction issues and yeah. gone through it and it's wiped out their addiction issues, it's pretty staggering. But you know, that isn't only true of Ibogaine. That's true of things like um, ayahuasca, ayahuasca, mushrooms, mushrooms ketamine, mm -hmm. um, electroconvulsive shock therapy. Really? These things, and, and this is a hypothesis, I'm, you know, this is a theory I have, that all of these things act this, in a similar way on the brain to reset, to cause a systemic wide sort of flip the switch. Um, you know, ECT uh, is still used for medication resistant depression. It's one of the few things that works if drugs don't work for your depression. ECT will lift your depression. Um, so will ketamine. You know, one is zapping you, one is sedating you, but I think they're really going after sort of a reset uh, deep in the brain in some way. So this transformative experience being so completely alien to normal states of consciousness yeah. is enough to give you this new new blank slate, or at I least a so. new starting point. Yeah, or at least, you know, maybe it, it could be sort of hormetic. It could be a stressor your body reacts to with healing. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Almost anything that affects depression, that lifts depression, does so by raising um, a neurotrophic factor in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is involved with memory formation, also exploring the environments. And there's a compound called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a growth hormone or growth factor in the brain. Anything that lifts depression raises BDNF. Hmm. BDNF is the final common pathway, if you will, of antidepressants. It's not serotonin, not you know, dopamine, norepinephrine, it's not exercise. It doesn't matter what you say your antidepressant drug or mechanism is, how it actually works downstream is BDNF. Oh, that's fascinating. I'm really glad you brought up, really glad you brought up the expression depression. Yeah. Because um, I, I, don't, I don't suffer from depression. I've had many close friends who do. Sure. And I've always been concerned or confused or curious as to what causes it. Is it an environmental issue? Is it a biological issue? Is it a combination of the two? Yeah. Because I've had friends whose lives were not going well. Uh, their career mm -hmm. wasn't going well. Their r romantic life wasn't going well. And they were, quote, unquote, depressed. Right. Then their career turned around, their romantic life turned around, and they were no longer depressed. Yeah. And so I've always wondered how much of this idea that we have of someone being sick right. is just based on the input that you're getting from your environment, whether or not you're getting positive feedback. If you're in love, you feel great. You know, you're with right. someone you care to be with. If you have a job that's awesome, you get excited to go to work. All these things are good. You're, 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 you're doing well. You don't have to worry about your bills. You're in a, a rewarding relationship where mm -hmm. you feel supported and loved. You don't have this feedback feeling all the time mm -hmm. of being lonely or being left out. How much of that is it an environmental issue? Yeah. How much of that is just your brain is lacking a certain amount of pills? And how many people are medicated because their environment is shitty? Yeah. And so instead of giving you the impetus to change and alter your environment to benefit you, you're instead given a pill that makes yeah. your environment tolerable. 
Yeah, it's a really complex uh, question. Um, yeah. There's a few things to think about. One is things like depression or anxiety aren't always bad. You know, there's often a good reason to be sad or a good reason to be tense. You know, like if your spouse dies, you're going to be depressed. You know, you have an exogenous, an outside cause for your depression. You lose your job, you, you know, your bank account's empty. There's lots of good reasons to be stressed and to have sort of negative emotional reactions to those things. Anxiety is the same way. If you're being chased by a tiger, you better be anxious. You better run. Um, when someone's life becomes less stressful, you're right, some people become not depressed anymore. And that's, I would consider that like a low key form of depression. If, if they just get a little bit depressed or depressed because of exogenous you know, life things, um, the, all the diagnose, uh, diagnostic criteria for uh, depression suggest that you need to have all these symptoms for many weeks, I think it's two or three weeks minimum, across more than one uh, domain of your life. So it's not simply being sad for, a few weeks because of a you know a bad thing that happened to you. It's what happens with how your emotional regulation gets changed by that or turns into a problem. So there are many people; their lives get better. They get a new job. They you know have things perk up, and they don't become non-depressed. They stay depressed. They stay maybe just anhedonic. They can't experience joy for something for, for, from from their life, or they experience you know more subtle swings of mood than, than full-blown depression. But depression can last even in the face of your life being awesome. You know? How long has it been that we have diagnosed this idea of depression? I mean, for the longest long time. time, how long? Like how many decades? Um, several, certainly. I mean, Two or three? More something. than that. Yeah, I would, that I, would, I would say that major depression, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not actually sure when, when it crept into the DSM. The, the, the whole issue of diagnosis is a very thorny issue anyways. The DSM was not really developed, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is what psychologists and psychiatrists use for diagnoses, was not really developed to help with diagnoses. It was developed to help with insurance companies. It's kind of like the BMI. You know, the BMI for you and me would say we're overweight, if not obese, because right. we're, you know, pretty beefy guys. But I'm not obese at 180 pounds. Right. You know, but if I was, if my body fat was higher, muscle mass was lower, I would be. And the same thing's true with diagnoses. It was really a tool used to figure out what to pay on insurance to some extent. Mm. And so at a population level, if I took 1,000 people, the BMI would, would work pretty well for most of them. And the same is true of the DSM. It works pretty well at a population level. But when you drill down to the individual, sometimes their symptoms don't fit the DSM or the, how long they've had symptoms for or the, or the course of their disease doesn't really totally fit. And does the psychologist say, oh, you don't fit all the criteria, therefore I can't give you a diagnosis? No, they pick whatever's closest so that your insurance company can pay for their therapy and so that you can maybe get the drugs that they want to give you. Um, so it's a pretty vague, I mean, the diagnosis is not as precise a, a field as a non-psychologist might, might think. I love that you use that term disease because that's what I wanted to bring up because that's mm -hmm. what it's, it's referred to as a depression? disease. Yeah, yeah, depression is a disease yeah. and you hear it all the time and I, you hear it oftentimes in commercials that are selling drugs and that really yeah. concerns me because I'm like, well, you might be giving someone the green light to take a pill and it takes away the power. Power mm -hmm. from them takes away the power to change your life to yeah. alter your life for the better because you've got this horrible scenario in your life horrible situation circumstances whatever they're leading you to feel like shit all the time yeah. and someone's coming along and saying hey man you don't need to get a better job you, you you're depressed right and you know all is those it a disease it I mean I think it is a disease because it's um, you're not it at ease is mm -hmm. it dis-ease you're not at ease I sure mean? sure um, I think it can become a disease. It can become entrenched and become stuck in that mode. And that's when it's a big problem. Uh, you know, um, from the point of view of brain activity, if you look at depressed brains, if I brought in 100 depressed brains into my clinic and did brain mapping or QEEG on them, what I would find in most of them is um, an asymmetry in the frontal lobes. Many people who are depressed have an overactive right frontal lobe and an underactive left. This bias of left side being more active than right is typical. Glass half empty, approach the world, explore environments. When the right is more active than, than the left, you withdraw, you shut down, you don't want to do anything. 
And so there is a brain signature often present in major depression of a left-right bias that goes in the opposite direction. You know, if you measure the Dalai Lama, he'd be really strong left biased. What, is, what about bullshit? Is there a part that says bullshit? Yeah. Can you find out what that is on him? Uh, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you think he's full of shit? I don't think. I, I'm not buying the robes. Uh-huh. No. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. <laughs> what came first, the chicken or the egg, though, when it comes to this right-left brain thing? Really good point. Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, I've never, you know, tracked someone through being non-depressed into depressed because they'll come and see me once they're depressed. So it could be a predisposition. Your brain is a little bit like this, and you're a little bit, you know, oriented towards becoming a little bit depressed, and then stressors mount. I mean, genes are the same way. Genes only account for about 30% of our experience. And 70% of our experience is how the environment interacts with us. And the same is true of anything else that's cognitive or psychological. You may have a slight tendency towards a depressed brain, you know, right front dominance. But unless your life becomes sucky or things really build up or you feel unsafe or unmet or un, you know, fed or, or something else, you might not ever develop the depression patterns that really you get stuck in. Have you ever monitored people pre and post depression? Oh, like sure. someone who has recovered from it? And what are the what, what are the changes that you observe? I mean, all the time you see the, the asymmetry reverse, go back to the sort of normal or typical brain patterns. Yeah. Wow. yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, not every person with depression has frontal asymmetries. But it happens often enough that I believe it when I see it in the brain maps as a sign. I mean, I often do brain maps without doing clinical histories first because I don't want to be biased. So I'll sit you down and you know record some baselines, and then after I have the data, I'll say, okay, I'm seeing this pattern. I'm seeing some frontal asymmetries. You know, this this thing here. Uh, the literature suggests, and many people that come into my clinic have some depression when I, they see this pattern. Is that true for you? And I usually get a yeah. How'd you know? Um, or anxiety, there's patterns for, there's patterns for ADHD or trauma, you know, OCD or PTSD. Um, and so I tend to unpack what I'm looking at based on their symptoms and then confirm, uh, get them to confirm what I'm guessing. So now I want to do a brain scan. Before I was really not interested. I want to find out what the fuck is wrong with there me. There you go. I want to get in yeah, there. Yeah, come down to Beverly Hills and uh, we'll, uh, we'll hook you up. How long does it take? It takes under an hour. Uh, and if we, and we can do a pre and post a two condition map for you if you wanted mm -hmm. like a totally clean off of caffeine or you know something else marijuana marijuana Dude, you don't have to beat around the bush man I saw the look on your face no problem you had like a little half smile yeah yeah How sure dare sure you? so if if you want to you know come in one day without having smoked up mm -hmm. get a brain map that's gonna be tough and then smoke up um, we'll do another brain map and I'll show you how your brain changes. Um, and here's something interesting. Uh, the brain mapping is the assessment process. We often do the neurofeedback or the training process. Neurofeedback seems to reset tolerance to cannabis in a few days. Neurofeedback meaning? Biofeedback on brain waves. Biofeedback on brain waves meaning? What does that meaning mean? Meaning a training up or down specific, like making your brain make more beta and less theta, which is an, an attentive focused, calm state. And w how would you do that? So I would stick an electrode to the top of your head and measure the amount of, let's say, theta. And theta is a brain wave that when it goes up, you're distracted, impulsive, checked out. When it goes down, you're focused. And it's going to fluctuate moment to moment because you aren't making a static amount of this brain wave. You're making, you know, the amount your environment and your internal environment demands. And so whenever it tends to trend down, Maybe uh, I'll, I'll have you play one of your podcasts and the volume swell, the volume of your podcast will go up whenever your theta goes down. Hmm. Whenever your theta goes back up, the volume drops. And so your brain goes, hey, wait, I was listening to that, you know, interesting guy. And over several, you know, over half an hour, you might have uh, several hundred of these resuming of feedback, of rewards. And that can be something like an audio or a video. It can be a spaceship flying. It doesn't seem to matter how we reward the brain when training just when we yoke the rewards to some parameter that's changing in your brain. And by just stimulating various uh, areas on the scalp. Just measuring areas. Just measuring areas yeah, changes. The, stimu the, the stimulus, the, the, the feedback is actually coming in your eyes and ears. Music, video, mm. animations. But then, you know, when your brain trends or drifts in the wrong direction, the game stops, the music stops, the podcast audio drops, whatever it is you're, you're, you're playing with on the, on the computers. And it causes your mind to want to get it back. Your brain, your, it's, it's lower level than your mind. Yeah, you're, 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 okay, we'll define the difference. What's the difference? The mind is what you're aware of, I would okay. say. And, and, and this is a more core, low level. I mean, this, this process of biofeedback was discovered in the late 60s on cats. 
cats are notoriously bad instruction followers, right? Those fuckers. Right. So you're never going to, this is not a cognitive process. Cats didn't try to make, in, in, in this case, cats got a dropper of milk. Um, whenever their brain waves went up in one direction, milk came out of a dropper. And they learned over time to produce more of this brainwave that gave them a milk dropper. Oh, fascinating. And then six months, this, this one experiment that uh, Dr. Barry Sturman did in the late 60s, six months later, he pulled a bunch of cats out of his subject pool to do a uh, rocket fuel exposure experiment. NASA had said, hey, look, our astronauts are getting really sick. They're getting nauseous. How dangerous is this you know, hydrazine stuff we're using as rocket fuel? Could you please expose a bunch of animals to it and see you know, how much it takes to kill them? Um, or, or, or what the dose response curve is. And so Dr. Sturman at, at UCLA in the late 60s um, was exposing cats to increasing levels of rocket fuel vapors and found that a little bit, you know, they panted, a little more they stumbled, a little more they cried, and then like seizure, coma, death. This nice linear, you know, with increasing dose. Except of the cats he was using, a certain subset, like six of 30 or something, refused to have seizures. And the whole curve of unstable brain was pushed to the right. Couldn't figure out why until he realized, oh, wait a minute, I used these same six cats in a previous experiment to increase their brain waves. In this oh. one brain wave that, that, I, that I thought was a nice target to go after, it turns out that brain wave is the anti-seizure brain wave. When you train it up, you have decreased, dramatically decreased seizure activity in the brain. And so he found this, you know, this brain wave was sort of meta-stable in, in, in encouraging brain activity. And his uh, lab manager at the time was a medication uncontrolled epileptic, having like tens of seizures uh, a month, which is basically uh, a death sentence. Your brain will, you know, Swiss cheese over time, and you'll you'll have major, major long-term problems. Um, and she demanded he build her a biofeedback machine to train up this brain wave. And over the next year or two, they did some training, and after a couple of years, she went off all meds and was seizure-free. Whoa, that's crazy. And about that time, Barry Sturman's funding was all pulled. Really? He, probably, he submitted a uh, paper to Epilepsia, the journal, and suddenly his uh, government funding all vanished. So the conspiracy theorist, uh, you know, ideas start to mount when you think about, you know, the late 60s and big drug companies not wanting a non-drug intervention for epilepsy out there. Now, what is the current protocol on this stuff today? I mean, how many people are using this kind of treatment yeah, to deal with epilepsy? I'm not sure, actually. I'm, I'm not an epileptologist. I've had a few folks come through my center who you know, do have seizures, and I've reduced them. Um, but uh, I'm not sure of the numbers of epileptologists out there using it. Um, the numbers of neurofeedback providers, um, just as a hand-waving guess, let's say there's 10,000 in the U.S., and there's many more, of course, uh, throughout the world. When I go to big conferences, there's, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 people at the, tra the professional trade shows for this stuff. And there's two of them. So you figure extrapolating, there's at least 10,000 practitioners in, uh, in the U.S. In fact, just down the street here in uh, Woodland Hills, some of the, the, the giants in the field, the Othmers, uh, they sort of founded the field. Uh, soon after Sturman made these discoveries, the Othmers um, uh, at EEG Info launched um, sort of the field of neurofeedback for clinicians. They built software and hardware for many years for clinicians to use. Well, that is unbelievable. The idea that they would pull funding just because he's come up with something that takes away from the money that the pharmaceutical uh, and, and who knows if that's actually what happened, but it's, it's, it's a good story that there's this potential, you know, sort of big brother, big pharma uh, inflection. And this is not beyond the pale. This is, this is very possible. You know, when, um, when neurofeedback started getting really big, a lot of what it was first used for is ADHD. It's sort of the magic bullet for ADHD, you know. It's called the 20-hour solution for ADHD. Um, when... Uh, this was starting to really be used maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, a couple of the big drug companies were paying scientists to go to CHAD meetings, the, the ADHD support group meetings, and say, nope, neurofeedback doesn't work. Wow. They were being paid by the drug companies to go and you know, anti-shill for, for, you know, anti-neurofeedback. Well, we find that today with marijuana. We find that yeah. today with pharmaceutical companies paying people to talk badly and, and yeah. not just that, but testify yeah. about the negative aspects of cannabis. And then you find out they're being paid by pharmaceutical right. companies hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, I mean, wh when did money get in so deep into not only medicine, but politics? I mean, when, when you and I were kids, this wasn't like this, was it? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't paying attention as, as a 10-year-old. Yeah. I don't think we're as aware, or maybe it just wasn't as transparent. Just well, now the, well, we're aware Information, of it. you know, 
being everywhere wasn't really there in the 70s the way it is now, right? So Right. Well, all the Nixon studies, the, Nixon funded a bunch, the Nixon administration funded a bunch of studies trying to find the negative aspects of cannabis, and they and found so many positive. Yeah. Not just failed, found so many positive things they had to bury. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. We're dealing with that today. I mean, today you still have uh, there was, there was this horrible story, a uh, horrible video of the uh, head of the DEA having mm -hmm. a conversation with someone in Congress where the guy is breaking it down to her, saying, "What is worse? Is cannabis as bad as meth?" And she's like, "Well, they're both bad, and they're both bad." Okay, what is wor what has yeah. a negative, more negative health risks? Is it cannabis? Or is it meth? Yeah, and, and she, she won't do it. She won't do yeah. it because it's an ideology. It's right. a, she's got a, a, a very specific pattern of thinking and speaking that she's uh, supposed to engage in, and she won't vary. She won't deviate. Yeah, from and that. there's not unfortunately there's not a lot of good research out there. I mean, I'm I'm putting together a cannabis study with my lead tech at, at Alternatives, and we're going through a literature review trying to figure out what the state of the literature is. And uh, I'm looking at, you know, brain activity, so I'm, my, my questions are things like, well, how long is it active in your brain, and what are the brain changes that, that cannabis produces? And we're looking at studies from the 70s and some of them in the 80s, and little footnotes and methodology say, okay, the, you know, the THC concentration in this study is 2%, 2.5%, 2.1%, whatever. And nowadays, you know, the stuff being delivered to your door uh, from the collective is 20%, 23%, 25%. Cannabis has gotten ten times as strong since our parents were, you know. Well, that's all just dirt weed, though. There was a study that they did recently. They said that they got a hold of some marijuana from the 1960s and 70s, and there, the variation was between two to five percent for shitty weed, but as high as fifteen percent okay. for what they called Acapulco Gold, right? Sure, or sure. Sensimilia. Right. That's what the old timers exactly. used to call the good kind weed. bud. That's what they call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but so the, that. That means that the good weed of today and the great weed of then are pretty uh, similar. Yeah, but but the it, great yeah. weed of today is, is some next level shit. And, and and all the scientists and the average, you know, squares in the mm -hmm. late sixties didn't have access to the Acapulco gold. How did they not? The scientists? Well, I mean, all, all the studies were done on low potency compared to today, low, mm. low potency weed. So I'm not sure why they didn't have access to it, but they were all the, using two, three percent. They're probably worried about the man. Everybody was scared of, uh, you know, giving them the good weed. Yeah, probably. probably. They didn't know anybody. But today, you're dealing with these botanists that are going deep, and they're. Yep. I've heard as many as 35 percent. Oh, I've never seen that. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure I'd want that. It's a little too much. It's right here. Wow. Uh, 35? Wow. That's little, it. A little too much. That'll Is it oil? Blow your fucking head off. Wow. No, that's just some crazy weed that these guys have put together. 30 percent's a lot. I well, mean, I've given it to people that are from out of town, and uh, they don't function well on it. No. It, it, it hits them in a very strange... It's funny to watch. Do you, like, do you do it during your podcast? It's kind of cruel. I've done it. Wow. Um, not cruel. They ask for it. You okay. Know? They want to see what's up. But the, um, the real issue is... Uh, Really, that it's just what are you used to? Yeah. I mean, if yeah. you're used to this 34% THC, you know, you take one hit and you're good. Right. It's like alcohol. I mean, is alcohol is is stronger alcohol a problem? No, not really. We know that whiskey is stronger than wine. You know, we know that. So you drink a large glass of wine, you're fine. You don't drink a large glass of whiskey. Right. But it's harder to you know it's it's rather it's easier to get into trouble with whiskey than beer. Sure. Because the, the momentum has, you know, faster consequences. Yes. That's um, a very good point. So Marijuana and, is the same thing. And I mentioned that I eliminate tolerance to marijuana. In, in the first week of training, people's tolerance is gone, like just gone. And I work with people that are often like, yeah, man, I'm professional. I know what I'm doing. Shut up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, just be really careful. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm good. I've been smoking for 25 years. How does this tolerance get minimized? I'm not sure what the mechanism is. I just know that it's a real effect because people come back the next day and like, yeah, man, I smoked up and I like stared at the ceiling all night. I couldn't get out of the couch <laughs> and I couldn't, I was, I, I was drooling during dinner. Couldn't talk to my wife. What did you do to me? It's like the first, it's, it's like giving a giant blunt to a high school kid who's never seen weed. Wow. You know, it's a, it's a multiple on the dose effect in some way. Does it deal with the effects of it from eating it as well as smoking it, or is it only smoking it? It must be this. It, it, it must be both. I haven't actually rigorously examined the differences, but it must be both. I would wonder, because the, the, the difference in eating it is very dramatically different. Because, you know, when it's processed by the liver, you know the whole... Yeah, but it's still THC. I mean, eventually the brain is still getting... 
a similar effect. It's I mean, actually not. It's 11 really? hydroxy metabolite. When, you, when it's processed by the liver, it's producing this new substance that's five oh, times really? more psychoactive than THC. I know it lasts a lot longer. I don't really enjoy eating it. Uh, it's not just last longer. It's a totally different drug. Okay. When you, your liver produces this, this metabolite, 11 hydroxy metabolite. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more potent, which is why when people eat cookies, they always think they're dying. Right. They always think, like, oh, my God, somebody dosed it. Like, if you see, I'm sure you've probably heard of this. There's a hilarious 911 call yeah. where these cops had stolen weed from these kids and made brownies with it. And oh, then they eat the brownies and they call 911 and they're like, time's going by really slow. I think we're dead. You never heard it? No. It's hilarious. Oh my god, that's funny. It's you should pull it up, Jamie, because yeah. it's everyone should hear this because it's so fucking stupid. It just shows you that cops are just people, and the right. idea that you could d give these people is this a nine one one call. He wants to know why no charges have been filed against a police officer who admits to confiscating marijuana from suspects and then baking it in brownies. And once he and his wife were full and high, they thought they'd overdosed and called nine one one. Listen to this. I think I'm having an overdose of the store my wife. Overdose of what? Marijuana. I don't know if it had something in it. Can you please send rescue? Did you guys have fever or anything? No, I'm just, I think we're dying. Okay, how much did you guys have? I, I don't know. We made brownies, and I think we're dead. Time is going by really, 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 really slow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, not I, responsible use right there. Yeah, I will listen to that to the day I die. A fucking dummy. Oh, Ugh. well, that's the the problem with eating it. Most people aren't aware. I mean, even you are not aware that yeah. you're eating it. It's a process called a one pass when it goes through your liver. Yeah, first pass metabolism. Yeah, yeah sure. and it blows your brain out oh. the back of your head. It's now you know one of the uh, one of the tricks to bring somebody down who's over indulged? caffeine. Ibuprofen. Really? Yeah, ibuprofen seems to take the edge off of weed. So do nootropics. Uh, but ibuprofen specifically seems to reduce the memory impairments you get when you smoke. That's fascinating. The memory impairment, the short-term memory impairment. And, and potentially long-term learning memory as well. What about the actual feeling of being high? Does it, it can, mitigate it, that? Just a tiny bit can take the edge off. Like I've had friends that have, you know, oh my God, I'm dying. I've you know done too much. I've eaten three cookies, whatever. Mm -hmm. And well, here's some ibuprofen. And 20 minutes later, okay, thank you. What do you give them? Like 800 milligrams? Like, like 400. 400. Yeah. And I, I hear there's a new trend in, in uh, college students studying with 200 milligrams of ibuprofen and a bong hit. Whoa, these because, fucking wacky Because they kids. don't affect the memory formation. I'm glad you brought that up because a big problem in college today is Adderall. Oh my God, huge problem. Now, huge. Now, what's going on with that? Because that seems to me, I've never done Adderall, but from the people that I've talked to that have and mm -hmm. understand it, it's a stimulant like very close to amphetamines. Very or, close to meth. Very close to meth. Yeah, much lower dose and slightly different molecule, but but very, very close to um, a you know, strict class strip stimulant. My uh, good friend, the late, great Robert Schimmel, who was a hilarious stand-up comedian and a great guy, he had a bunch of uh, health issues himself, and um, uh, he accidentally took Adderall once. And uh, he had taken the wrong medication. Mm -hmm. I don't know like whose it was, or I don't, I'm, I don't remember the story. But I remember he called his doctor up and he said, "Hey, I took this Adderall. Like, I, am I fucked? Because he had heart issues." Mm. And uh, the doctor said, "No, nope, you're going to be fine. Just, uh, just ride it out. You're yeah. going to be fine. But you know, obviously, don't take it again. But right. uh, and, you know, if anything goes horribly wrong." call me, but I think you're going to be fine. And he said he just cleaned his house and organized his notes. He said he took all of his comedy notes and just went over them. He said, yeah. I couldn't believe how organized I was. He was so motivated to get things yeah. done. And that, and that push of stimulants does happen. This is why students abuse it. But that push doesn't continue if you take it every day. Okay. Right. So it's like you're chasing the dragon. Yeah. As a, as yeah. And the euphoria. I mean, your, your friend had some euphoria probably from yeah. it too. That goes away as soon as you're used to the drug. Well, he wasn't interested in doing it again. He just accidentally did it, but he's like, God, I got so much work done. Yeah. And I've, I've heard that before. Like my friend Eddie, <laughs> my friend Eddie Bravo dated uh, a few gals who had problems with stimulants. Uh -huh. And uh, he said you would always tell because you go over to their house and be fucking spotless. He was like, those chicks <laughs> would always be cleaning their oh, apartments. No. They would just constantly be cleaning. Yeah, yeah. What is it about stimulants that make you want to get things done? Well, dopamine is the primary neurotransmitter boosted by stimulants and dopamine is the reward signal. It's the salient. This is interesting. This is motivating. So you get a motivation. You know, you find even boring tasks interesting. <laughs> wow. So 
you would want to do things like clean your house. Yeah, because you want to do something, because you want to engage with your environment. You want to explore, reshuffle, play around with your environment. Now, for kids, this chasing the dragon thing with college has got to be a giant issue, though, right? You're popping these pills, and at first it's benefiting you, and then slowly that starts to wear out, so you're taking more. And a lot of kids aren't ADHD, not dramatically, and they're taking stimulants off-label, other people's, you know, black market prescriptions. Um, and you know, there are some consequences to psychostimulants. There are some negative consequences if you're not managing them in the absolute right way you should, including things like cardiovascular side effects and habit formation and appetite suppression. And you know, all these things can cause major issues for I me. Mean, college students are some of the least healthy people anyways. Yeah. They're sleep deprived. Mm-hmm. They eat like crap. They don't know how to like live their lives as adults yet, but they have no structure that their parents used to give them. Um, and so with all of these problems, you throw a stimulant into the mix and they find they can be super productive on it. And you find kids that are now drug seeking or, you know, trying to get diagnoses so they can get drugs. Yeah, we had this uh, young gal who was an intern on Fear Factor back in the day. And she was very nice. And you would never think of her as being someone that had a, a problem with the drugs. Mm-hmm. But boy, you bring up Adderall around her and like, ding! Yeah. Her eyes would light up like she had like two like white stars yeah. for pupils and she'd be like, who has Adderall? That's the cocaine response, right? Oh, that's yeah. my cocaine. You know, that's, that's, the, yeah. that's the, it's the, it's the reward. It's the dopamine hit makes you go, oh, yes, that's the most yeah. interesting thing I've ever heard of. You know? Yeah. I was watching her and this guy, this other guy who used to work there and they had this conversation and he's like, yeah, well, you know, I would just take Adderall and she's like, you got Adderall? You have Adderall? Like, and yeah. they, they, it was weird. It was like you were watching someone, like, tra- it was like Gollum in the ring. Yeah. Like, oh, precious. Yeah, precious. yeah. Dopaminergic drugs are, not, are, you know, in my opinion, some of the most dangerous things we have because they, mm. they hijack learning because yeah. they really get in the way. And so it's not just that it's pleasurable and that's reinforcing. It's the pleasurable and dopamine gets boosted to super physiological levels. Well, how ironic that it hijacks learning when you're using it to help learn. Yeah. But you're not really learning, right? You're just studying. Yeah. Um, some of the psychostimulants do seem to improve learning. I think Ritalin is in that class, but Ritalin is a very atypical psychostimulant, a methylphenidate. It's not a typical like Adderall or something. And it, it, it actually um, improves seems, learning? It seems to improve long-term potentiation or at least, at least uh, um, uh, affect it in some way that is not negative. What about Pro Vigil and New Vigil? Those are other drugs. I'm a that huge. Are... Um, I hate them. Really? Yeah. I uh, uh, I took modafinil Pro Vigil myself off label for attention uh, and just about died from it. Whoa! Ended up in the hospital, head to toe hives, uh, lungs closing up. Whoa! I've yeah. never heard that. What... I had a massive systemic reaction to it. And um, people that have attention problems, and I grew up, you know, ADHD. People that have attention problems have dramatically increased side effects. From that class of drugs, ProVigil, NuVigil, Adafinil, you know, Arbidafinil. I've taken that stuff and nothing. Yep. Nothing's happened to me at all. But I, I take 150 milligrams. I took I've 100, 100 every morning and, and, and for two weeks. Well, it's prescribed to take every day. I mean, when you're prescribed, you take it every day. That's how it's supposed to be. Oh, so you were given a prescription. I was given a prescription. This, this wasn't it, just an experiment. No. Okay. I mean, it was an experiment because I didn't like psychostimulants. Mm. And I said, hey, How long ago was this? This is uh, just before I launched True Brain, which was one of the reasons I did it. So, like two and a half years ago. Um, and I ended up, you know, in the ER, at UCLA, literally head to toe hives. I couldn't, I couldn't, wow. I was miserable for about three and a half weeks. Whoa. And I, it was, what they, what they said eventually was it was something called, um, erythema multiform minor. And there's a major form that's called Steven Johnson syndrome. And that's where your skin peels off. Whoa, dude. So I, you know, I, I luckily didn't have that major version, but I was still incredibly miserable and, and my lungs were, you know, having major issues. So I, I, I just about died from modafinil. I've heard many people that are terrified of that stuff, but they couldn't figure out a reason why. And yours is the first yeah. real legitimate. Well, it boosts brain histamine, and histamine is like, like a, a master neurotransmitter, and all the other neurotransmitters can be modulated by it. So you raise histamine, you raise dopamine. Raise histamine, you raise serotonin. Um, and for me, the histamine, the brain histamine, caused a body histamine over sensitization or reaction or something. Wow. So, and this is not uncommon. If you look at the old, like some of the review papers on modafinil, you find that all of the studies on people with ADHD have incredibly dramatically increased side effects compared to non-ADHD people. 
So you shouldn't use, you know, modafinil is great if you're a sleep, you know, a, a narcoleptic person or somebody who's doing, you know, sleep wake shift disorders or things. But unless you absolutely need it to modify your sleep, it's not great for attention. I mean, I, I got some mild attention benefits from it the first couple of weeks. It's just nothing compared to psychostimulants. It's nothing compared to neurofeedback or even like meditation. Mindfulness can change your brain and shore up attention resources. I want to get to mindfulness in a moment, but what what is the difference between new vigil and pro vigil? Yeah, so modafinil, the the, the first product is you know, pro vigil is the is the brand name, um, is a is a mix of left and right hand molecules. Um, when you're making uh, organic chemistry, things are sort of naturally developed and sort of two mirror image molecules in most uh, chemical synthesis. And so there's an L and an R form of the uh, modafinil. In the, in, in they're mixed in the modafinil product. In the, in the R modafinil, which is new vigil, it's only one half. It's the, it's the right hand molecule, the R. Um, and so the R molecule, uh, theoretically, you know, typically in, in, or, in brain chemistry, one of the molecules is psychoactive, and one of them is much, much less so and or causes side effects. So a lot of the modern drugs will use an, uh, an L or an R form only and, and get rid of the other half of the molecule. Um, modafinil, both the L and the R uh, versions of the molecule are psychoactive. The R form is a little more psychoactive and tends to have a more stimulant type feeling. So um, subjectively, I've taken both. Subjectively, modafinil is you know interesting and has this sort of bimodal peak where you get one hump six hours in, another hump about twelve hours in. Uh, R modafinil has the same sort of six, twelve to sixteen hour window of activity, but it's only one peak of activity. It's because you only have one molecule. So in regular modafinil, you're you're metabolizing two different substances, if you will, and having slightly different effects from them. And the R modafinil is only one half of the molecule, or, or of the mix of molecules you would get. I've only tried New Vigil. I haven't tried yeah. Pro Vigil, but yeah. I've I've done it many times when I'm tired. So so New so Pro Vigil will be a little bit less stimulating. And you might have some additional effects from it that are not new vigil or pro vigil. Pro. pro, pro is the mix of L and R. New vigil. Uh, the the generic name for new vigil is R modafinil. Okay. You know A R modafinil, but it's the letter R. You can think of it that way for the right hand molecule. So that that's the more discrete, theoretically fewer side effects. It's a bit stronger in some ways. Um, more of a stimulant effect, where where pro, where pro vigil or modafinil is the is the racemic mix of the left and right hand molecules. And when you started having your side effects, was this a, an accumulative effect? Did you f did yeah, you see it right they, away? That, no, no, no. It took about 12, 13 days in before I had a. And it, like I woke up, uh, my hands were kind of puffy and itchy, and by the end of that day, there was like deep, deep soreness in, in a lot of parts of my body. And oh. um, like the bottoms of my feet and my palms were like sensitive and itchy. Whoa. And I didn't take any more. And the next day I woke up like with a pressure or a carrier, massive hives. Uh, so you knew that it was most likely related to that? Well, I have no allergies to any medications. I've never experienced anything else like that. I've never had hives in my life. I'm not someone who gets, you know, hay fever. Um, so I had no idea, but the only thing I'd added into my uh, sort of regimen, I, at the same time, at the end of this two weeks, I also got the flu. Wow. And it's, po it's likely that the immune you know, sort of you know, surge of getting the flu interacted in some way with the histamine surge from the provigil. And the two things together were sort of a perfect storm of my body hating itself. <laughs> you know? Wow. But... I am not a fan. And I also think that the, the gains, the possible gains, uh, attention, cognition, focus, from modafinil are, are minor. Mm -hmm. Not that dramatic. I mean, uh, uh, choline forms, alpha GPC, uh, much stronger support to cognition than modafinil is. Well, I found that to be the, the case. Uh, I found choline to be much better as far as memory retention and execution and things along those lines. But as far as uh, being awake. Yeah, less wakeful promoting. But, yeah. but wakefulness and cognition are not necessarily the same right. thing. Yes, I agree. Um, so, you know, wakefulness... If that's your issue because of narcolepsy, because you're working night shift, there may be a reason. You know, you're a, you're a, jet, fi a, a jet fighter or an airline pilot, you know, commercial airline pilot, where you're up for many hours, you know, having to remain on. Mm -hmm. Sure, there's, there's a reason uh, it might make sense. But not if you're a biohacker just trying to get a little more out of your schoolwork or more out of your, you know, high-powered business day. I don't think there's really any, 
benefit or any good reason to take modafinil compared to what else is out there. Yeah, I know a dude who was taking it every day for like eight, nine years, mm -hmm. and he was wacky as fuck. Mm -hmm. And I think that might have had something to do with it. Maybe. Yeah. Just and Ch again, not chicken and being, egg, you know. Yeah, not being forthcoming about taking it either. It's one of those weird things you wanted to kind of keep on the DL. Hmm. Um, Tim Ferriss, who wrote a book, uh, The Four Hour Body, sure. you know, Tim, yeah. uh, he d didn't want to talk about it in his book because he was worried that people would start taking it like candy. And they and they are to some extent, yeah. especially in Silicon, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, yeah, yeah. I was just going to bring that up. Um, you know, and, and Dave people, Asprey talks mm -hmm. about, you know, modafinil, and, and they're all very pro modafinil. I think I'm the only guy out there in the biohacking space who's like, this stuff is so this stuff is, is, is minimally effective, it's dangerous. And unless you're an narcoleptic, it's just not for you. Well, coincidentally, you're the only one qualified to actually discuss the real mechanisms Maybe. of the compounds and the yeah. way they affect yeah. your brain. Yeah, I mean, and, and we don't know what modafinil really does to the brain. There's some theories. We think it boosts brain histamine. We think it sort of flushes the orexin system, the hypothalamus, to uh, make you wakeful. But that's all still theory. What about this shit? Cannabis? No, this isn't cannabis. What is that? This is tobacco. This is uh -huh. one of these wacky vape pipes thing that the kids are smoking. Uh -huh. You see these things? Like... Interesting. It's a vaporizer for tobacco? Yeah, everybody's smoking tobacco out of these wacky things. Yeah, I'm not a fan of tobacco. I, I was a cigarette smoker for a few years. You were? Yeah, maybe like five years or six years. How long ago was this? Um, I probably quit about a 12 or 13 years ago. Um, so I, I think I smoked from like, you know, college and then a few years after the nicotine though nicotine as a drug yeah. does have some sort of a benefit or some sort of a, a promotion of cognitive function yeah it's, it hits glutamate receptors it's it affects learning in some ways we think uh, sorry acetylcholine receptors um, mm -hmm. uh, we think it's absolutely uh, affecting learning in some way um, but nicotine of course is fairly addictive Right. And nicotine is also carcinogenic all by itself. All by itself. Even though it's it has some much medicinal less benefits. So, yeah, much less so carcinogenic than like tobacco, burnt right. tobacco. But nicotine, even by itself, has some carcinogenic properties. But you see the carcinogenic effects or the, 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 the people that have uh, an issue with cigarette smoking, it's far more likely to cause cancer than it is people that are using, like say, like cigars. Mostly right. because they aren't getting the dosages. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, people that have they use cigars are much more likely to have oral cancers. Right. People it's in that their smoke mouth. have lung cancers. Mm -hmm. But it, what are the numbers on on cigar smoking? Because what I understand, what what I've read is it's fairly uncommon for people who are regular cigar smokers to get mouth cancer. Like you might have to be one of those yeah. wacky. You know George Burns type characters. Right, he's always carrying one around. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, I think you're right. I just think that as a class, like. You know what's the, what's the benefit? It's minimal. Again, some 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 benefits to learning cognition, but you can get those same benefits by getting a good night's sleep, really, or by you know, meditating. Um, I so have friends that are writers that are cigarette smokers, and they say there's nothing like it. Like Tony Hinchcliffe, he just can't get off the cigarettes when he's uh, writing. Like he wrote for the Justin Bieber roast recently, mm -hmm. and he said when he's in a writer's room yeah. and, and he starts firing up the cigarettes, the ideas just start flowing. Sure, and you know, is that state dependent learning? Because that's when he always writes. Could be right. Um, also, you know, the same we said for alcohol. How many how many writers would say alcohol is their muse? Mm. A lot. I mean, this is sort of like like the, the the Steinbeck disease, right? Hemingway. I mean, yeah. Hemingway. This is this is really. I mean, and is it true? Mm. Mm, I don't know. Yes, you can get yourself out of your own way. You can get some, you know, some some chemical support and start being creative. But is it really, you know, helping you be generative with new ideas, or is it just helping you not be stressed, or is it simply that you've associated being creative with drinking? Well, I know marijuana. There's no doubt about uh, it. It's a little bit different. That, yeah, that's I, giving I, you I some agree. ideas that just don't exist other than in the right. marijuana state. And they might not be good ideas. Yeah, some like, of them are they, terrible when you're sober. They sound great when you're. <laughs> oh my god, I just discovered everything. <laughs> and then later you're like, what the hell was I thinking? That doesn't. Mm. Is that all I thought? Well, that's not as exciting as I thought. Well, it's also you try to like read what you wrote down, and you're like, I used to have a joke about it. How did it go? That I wrote down. I actually wrote this down. A unicorn is a donkey from the future. And I wrote that down on paper. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Like, this shows you. Like, right. th that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But when I was high, I was like, this is hilarious. It'd be funny if your audience was high. Even if they were high, they'd be like, um, what? 
a unicorn's a donkey from the future? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, not really. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but there's something that happens when you do smoke marijuana that does excite the creative aspect of, of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. And, you know, we don't, Good again, or bad. We, we again, don't know everything cannabis is doing. It's not simply one, you know, not simply THC or the 11 form from, you know, liver format. Mm -hmm. There's like 700 different psychoactive compounds in the burning plant, right? And they, they differ depending on the strain. Dramatically sometimes. Yeah. I mean, sativa and indica are not the same plant. Yeah, you know, they they came from very different sort of you know, you know genetic trees, if you will. Sure, one being the, the South American variety, mm -hmm. and one being one one of in, in intensely tropical climates. Yeah, and they have some, cycles. and they have different benefits, and mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I mean, I don't think we yet know, and I'm I'm kind of excited by what's happening with the the medical and recreational cannabis in this country because we're finally doing some of the research, we're finally looking into constituent components, all the other cannabinoids beyond THC. Um, we're starting to examine the endocannabinoid. We, we have a cannabinoid system built in. Um, there's a neurotransmitter called Ananda, you know, the Sanskrit word for bliss, that hits our uh, endocannabinoid systems. Um, that's Ananda? That's what the Sanskrit Ananda's, word for yeah, bliss is? We're, yeah, exactly. That's fascinating. And we have, uh, you know, we, we, found the con we found the receptor in the body before we found the, um, the ligand, the binding compound in the body. But we knew that this thing and this receptor in the body existed, and cannabis bound to it. And so this receptor, did, this, was this developed from the, the, the human body growing up or evolving with the use of this, this plant? Is that no, what it's from, um, or is it just inherently I, a part of our system? I think it's inherently a part of our system. I mean, you know, evolution is, tends, to, tends to reinvent the same thing and tends to conserve biological constructs, molecules, organ systems across species. So like, you know, a, a mouse has a heart, so does a human. They also have uh, endogenous, uh, you know, cannabinoid systems. Um, I think we have two, at least two categories of cannabinoid systems. One is immune and one is bliss. And we know uh, an exogenous, a, a plant that affects the bliss system, you know, cannabis. Um, echinacea affects the other cannabinoid system. Echinacea is a, an herb that boosts your immune system. And does it really work to boost your immune system? I think it does, yeah. I mean, I've, I certainly have taken it. Um, if, if you take it when you're just starting to get sick, it can shut down an illness, in my experience. Really? Yeah. Um, I've always wondered whether or not that was legit. I think it is. I, I don't think it's a, as dramatic as you know, antibiotics or anything, um, but I do think there's, some, there's something there. But, you know, this, this, this plant, this purple coneflower, echinacea plant, um, is a cannabinoid. Uh, you know, it affects your cannabinoid system. That's how it affects your immune system. That's amazing. Uh, what about CBDs and CBDs in relationship to cancer, which is something yeah. that is being researched quite a bit lately? Yeah, I am not up on all the research. Some of the first papers over the past couple of decades were all CBD, 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 you know, reducing inflammation, reducing cancer, killing cancer cells. I've seen a few papers recently that say the non-CBD compounds also do that and do it better. Wow, non-CBD Like THC oils. has, has anti-cancer properties. And do it better than CBDs. It may, yeah. CBDs being good for inflammation, joint pain, things along those lines. The paper I read had THC also working on all those other aspects as well. Wow. So the isolation of the CBD might just be because people are trying to avoid THC? Trying to avoid the psychoactive, yeah. Because mm. CBD... Um, the non-psychoactive. It's non-psychoactive. In fact, the ratio of CBD to THC affects the, how psychoactive something is. So too much CBD and you aren't going to get high off your pot, ah, even in the presence of THC. Interesting. Um, they counteract each they other. They counteract each other, exactly. Sort of an inbuilt check. Is it frustrating to you that all this stuff, which probably could have been figured out a long time ago, were legal? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's a little frustrating, but I look at, you know, if you go back, you know, 100 years ago, technology was nowhere compared to where it is right now. I, I sort of see us on the, you know, the exponential curve, the hockey stick of acceleration now. So would it have been nice if 50 years ago we were getting into this stuff? Sure. But uh, it doesn't, on a, on, a, on a global time scale, it doesn't really bother me that it's happening now versus last decade. No. Well, it doesn't bother me that it's happening now. What bothers me is the suppression that exists. Mm -hmm. That it used to exist, like the same suppression that caused this uh, this reluctance of pharmaceutical companies to accept this mm -hmm. treatment of epilepsy that didn't involve drugs that they sell. Well, the initial anti-cannabis movement was uh, 
textiles in this mm -hmm. country, right? It was, yeah, textiles and paper, actually. Yeah, I mean, they didn't want the flax or the, the, the fibers coming in and, and supplanting the cotton industry and the fuel industries and things. It was directly connected to the production and creation of a machine called a decorticator. Decorticator? Yeah, the decorticator was the first time that they developed a system of processing hemp fire that didn't involve slavery or hard manual labor. Huh. The reason why cotton took such a foothold is because they came up with the cotton gin when right. Eli Whitney right, right. <clears throat> came up with the cotton gin, cotton uh, became much more viable mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. cannabis, than hemp. The right, fibers right. of hemp are far stronger, far superior for oh, making yeah. paper and cloth. It's just way tougher. Absolutely, like 10 times what mm -hmm. cotton is or something. Canvas. Yeah. Canvas comes from the word cannabis. Cannabis hmm. was originally a hemp product. Oh, interesting. I had no far idea. More, far more durable. Yeah. Far more durable for pants. The original Levi's were made out of canvas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was all cannabis. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. it's all hemp based until that motherfucker that they made that book or they made the the movie um, Reefer uh, Madness. No, it wasn't that. It was uh, it was uh, William Randolph Hearst, oh, uh, right, the right. Orson Welles movie, right. yeah. uh, Citizen Kane. Yeah. It was that yeah. was all about this one asshole. Right. William Randolph Hearst owned Hearst Enterprises. He owned you know all the newspapers. He owned. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just had this massive stranglehold on information. Yeah. And he was a motherfucker. <laughs> and this guy came out with the idea of first of all they got in cahoots with uh, Harry Anslinger and uh, they they decided to call it marijuana which wasn't the name for it before hmm. marijuana was the name for a wild Mexican tobacco plant it oh, wasn't even it wasn't even cannabis so when Congress was outlawing marijuana they didn't exactly understand that they were outlawing hemp as a textile and as a oh, commodity interesting so then you had to get like a tax stamp in order to grow hemp and then you know they needed it for world war ii so they started this campaign hemp for victory mm -hmm. and hemp for victory was this uh famous video that they uh that jack uh herrer who was a jack famous herrer, sure yeah famous marijuana activist found this video to sort of ex sort of establish what he had been saying all along like look this is something that we had grown and used as a culture yeah. for thousands of years yeah. human beings it's, it's it was a huge part of I mean, it was what George W. or George Herbert Walker Bush, it was what his parachute was made of when he parachuted to safety in mm -hmm. World War II. Mm -hmm. It was what the sails that Columbus sailed on mm -hmm. was made out of. They were all made out of hemp. Yep. yep. Rope. Yeah, all of it. Rope. And when they decided to demonize it, the way they did it was to go after racism. They said this marijuana plant right. was making blacks and Mexicans right. rape white women. Right, right. And everybody right. went fucking crazy. Yeah, well, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and marketing mm -hmm. was even sort of, you know, a big player back then. And nowadays, you, it's hard to get good information about anything without, you know, a, a decent degree to understand what the noise, where the noise is sure. coming from. But it's in a, a lot of ways, it's very similar to what you're saying about taking away this uh, non-drug option of c treating epilepsy. Yeah, it's like they realize that okay, there's money to be made with this one solution this mm -hmm. new solution there's no money to be made mm -hmm. let's attack it yeah and that's what they did yeah yeah i mean there's there's people making cbd or cbn only strains of cannabis purely for epilep epileptics now that mm -hmm. they suppress seizures i mean you don't want to give a five-year-old kid a joint you know they're already pretty stoned as a five-year-old mm -hmm. right but cbn or cbd can suppress uh epileptic activity you know where is the, i mean that's a charged issue giving a kid cannabis mm -hmm. But uh, I don't see any ethical or, or problematic, uh, you know, use even with children if you're using it as an anti-epileptic intervention. Well, I have direct experience with a very good friend of mine who mm -hmm. has a child who has extreme epileptic seizures. He give he gives the kid medical cannabis now. He moved to a yeah. state where it's legal. Yeah. He moved to uh, Washington State, and he gives his kid a very small amount every day, and there's no long no longer any seizures. Yeah. This yeah. kid was having multiple seizures a day. He's more, he's also got, he's on the autism spectrum. He's also got like some pretty severe social issues, yeah. which were mitigated substantially once he started oh, taking interesting. this. interesting, interesting. But there's all sorts of other connections to gut bacteria and yeah. there's a bunch of inflammation issues, yep. diet and things that change that for, for kids who suffer from these things that they yeah, don't absolutely. totally, truly understand. Right. And, and we may never, because I mean, every individual is a little bit different too. I mean, autism specifically is not really one thing. It's more like the autism. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the only thing consistent across them is the social deficit, but you can have a high functioning uh, Asperger's individual with, you know, superior cognitive skills, mm. incredible abilities, but still some deficits in other areas. And it's so, they're so concerned with opening up the doorway to this stuff that even non psychoactive versions of these plants are illegal. Right. Like hemp right. is right. illegal. We have a huge issue with that at Onnit, my supplement company, mm -hmm. because we sell protein. Hemp protein is uh, very bioavailable, but yeah. we have to get it from Canada. Right. Because we can't, you, 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 can, you sort of can grow it. With the states, didn't, didn't that law just change like last week that yes, we can now start growing of. commercial hemp? Yes, sort of. You would know more. It yeah. sort of has. It okay. sort of has, but it's got a lot of resistance. It's got a, resi a lot of resistance in terms of how it's going to react or how uh, the federal government is going to react to it if a Republican gets in office in mm. 2016. Yeah. That's also one of the things about medical marijuana. Like they, they've recently mm -hmm. softened their stance considerably on medical marijuana, but all it takes is like one thing, one Jeb Bush motherfucker right. to get into office and things can get really weird. But as of right now, we have to get our stuff from Canada. Interesting. We would love to buy it from America, from American yeah, farmers, yeah. and but also it just should be something that people could. It's it's a plant. Right. It's, it's ridiculous. It's not killing anybody, and it's a plant. It should be really that simple. Right. Does it kill anybody? No. Is, is it well, you know, turning if, people if into slaves? Aspirin was invented today. If aspirin was invented today, aspirin would be a scheduled substance. That's amazing. Controlled substance. It probably would, right? It because has side effects. It can kill you. Sure. Yeah, and not only that, there's a lot of medications that they prescribe, especially for people that have heart disease, yeah. where aspirin can just n oh, yeah. nip that shit right in the butt. Yeah. Aspirin is an amazing, amazing anti-inflammatory. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's, it's at least initially from a natural... Uh you know, willow bark. Yeah. So, can you can you get it in a natural form still? Is it available? Can you? I mean, you got in the forest and you know chew, the, the inner bark of a white willow tree. And that's all it and is. And chew it, and then you'll get acetylsalicylic acid. Yeah. Wow. And how will you know how much bark to chew? Um, I don't think the dosages are an issue when it when it's you know I think you'll absorb it and get pain relief or whatever. So it's only when you swallow it that it becomes an issue. No, I, I think it's it's being absorbed through the the mucosa, but I don't think you're going to get concentrated doses the way you do in tablets of aspirin. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, so like, you can overdose on the tablets. You can't overdose on chewing the bark. You probably can, but... You'd have to be an asshole. You'd have to be an asshole. And, and it probably <laughs> tastes like ass. I mean, it's, th th these are very bitter substances. So How did everybody ever find out that that gives you a, a relief from a headache? I don't know. Probably some, you know, druid brewing it in tea or something, you know, yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's a... It's an interesting thing that that's been around for so long, and there's so, and it's sort of like very subtly swept under the rug the health benefits of aspirin. Sure, sure. Well, you know, in, in, at least in the cardiac medicine, uh, there's still this <clears throat> focus of giving people the heart risks uh, or heart cardiac uh, risk of heart attack. You know, prophylactic doses of aspirin every day to reduce the strain on the blood system and. Yeah. Well, I've also heard people say that after you get to a certain age, you should just take aspirin any day, every day anyway, just to mitigate the natural reaction that your body has to inflammation. Yeah, or, or, the, or the clotting. It's really mm -hmm. about clotting. Um, and I think, you know, paracetam is a better uh, drug for that long term than aspirin because it has other benefits. That's interesting. I wanted to bring those up, this different nootropics like paracetam, mm -hmm. the, the different racetams. Uh, sure. What, what are your favorite ones when it comes to nootropics and what... what, right. what causes you to prefer those well you know i'm a i'm the one of the scientists at true brain so i help and true brain is you have it right here it's uh yeah we, we, we brought you some nootropic drink yeah we have drinks and capsule form uh and the drinks um sort of our the first to market little little mini drinks uh so you got three different colors here yeah three different green, colors blue and orange why and, why is it well one's caffeinated which one uh it should say on it hmm. the, it's, it's the blue or the green you don't know I forget. This is um, your shit, man. I know, I know. Well, we, we, we keep iterating and changing it. So this, ah. is, this, is the, this is the latest flavor we've ever come up with for okay, you. Okay, this is caffeine-free, the blue one. Right, is. So the green one's caffeinated then. Okay. And the orange one is the boost. So the blue and the green ones are paracetam-based with, with ah. uh, CDP choline. This is the original. Yep. The green's the original. The, gri the green's the caffeinated one. It has okay. 80 milligrams of caffeine, not a huge amount. And then the orange one is oxyracetam-based. 80 milligrams is not a lot? No. That's like a cup of coffee, though. Um, it's like a four ounce cup of coffee, of drip coffee. Isn't that though? But like, aren't we considering that because of like how jacked up Starbucks Maybe. is? Because Starbucks is a venti is two hundred milligrams of caffeine. More than that, is probably. It? Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 Caffeine somewhere between seventy five and one hundred and fifty milligrams um, for every eight ounces of drip, or one espresso shot. 
So it takes three espresso shots to equal like the amount of caffeine in a 12 ounce drip of coffee. Right. That's a lot of people think that espresso is much stronger. No, and the darker actually... you roast, the less caffeine you have in the bean, right? Yeah. So that's another thing that's a misconception, right? People think, oh, give me the dark roast. I want to get fucked up. No, a, a French roast is like up to a third less caffeine than a light roast. What do you got there, Jamie? 450. 450 milligrams from a, a 20? Yeah. From a, is that Starbucks? Yeah. Four is that a wow. venti? Okay, so 180, 180 is a short. That's what I was thinking of. So between a short, a tall, tall, tall's their middle, right? And then grande. I fucking hate all these foreign words. God damn it! Don't call it a grande. Call it a medium. Well, there's there's lots of reasons to boycott these guys. Now they they just went after okay. the what state else? of Vermont. Uh, Starbucks and Monsanto joined together to file suit against Vermont for mandating labeling of GMOs. What? Starbucks, Starbucks and Monsanto. They? they have GMO coffee? No. They just want to. They don't, they don't want to be mandated to label. When mm. and if. Well, there's an issue. Isn't there an issue with GMOs with that? Uh, there's an immediate demonification. Yeah, knee jerk. Yeah. yeah. When people don't understand that every fucking tomato you buy at a grocery store is genetically right. modified. There's no such thing as a non-GMO cow. There's no such thing as a non-GMO ear of corn. If you're eating ears yeah. of corn, that shit has been modified. Well, corn's been heavily modified I mean, recently in the past you know, 10, 20 years, but we've been GMOing cattle with selective breeding for thousands of years. Right, but isn't there a difference between selective breeding and splicing in non-native genetics, which they have done to increase There's the probably a difference. resistance to yeah. certain pesticides? Yeah, Roundup mostly. That, right. that yeah, freaks yeah. people out, no, rightly so, right? Totally, yeah, absolutely. Isn't it one of those things where there's not an either or? There's 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 benefits to genetically modifying sure. things to our advantage, but there's also Costs. greed yeah. and yeah. and also when people don't want to address the actual real health concerns of their creations. Yeah. And that's what people were worried yeah. about. That's why when Brazil as a country filed suit against uh, Monsanto or, and won. Yeah. I mean, the oh, Brazilian, right, right, farmers, right, right. Brazilian farmers uh, to, b joined together and filed this gigantic suit. But then there's the Indian farmers that they have this huge issue where they... they, they get leased out these seeds and then they, mm -hmm. they're in debt and they wind up committing suicide. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I heard that article <sighs> recently. God, it's it's staggering. If you, it's you sort of like the old sharecropping it. model where you, you know, rent the land, sell the seeds, mm -hmm. sell the tools, and, you know, now you must work for me for the next 60 years to make back your money. <sighs> yeah, and Monsanto is the one who's profiting off of yeah. it. And just, it's just, just a, what's this, Monsanto Latte. Tell Starbucks to serve only organic, non-GMO milk. True. Starbucks is a member of the Grocery Manufacturer Association oh, for Challenging Vermont claim. over GMO labeling requirements. False. Starbucks oh. has joined forces with Monsanto to I sue. I was fooled. How dare you? I know. I was How fooled. How dare you, Dr. Hill? How dare you? You're one of those guys. I Just guess for so. shit you find. Starbucks is not a part of Monsanto's GMO lawsuit. This is from Starbucks. So stop food labeling. All right. Well, now we know. Okay, and that great. was from 2014, sir. How dare you? I, I read an article recently that seemed legit. So what was I it know. in? The Onion? No, no, no. <laughs> it seemed legit. It was written in English. Right. right. It was on the internet. What the fuck's that's, wrong with That's people? the bar for some people, yeah. Some yeah. people. Well, there's a lot of, I mean, there's websites now that will just write stories. They don't even pretend that they're writing something that isn't a, like, it's not even funny. Yeah. Like, it's, they, they don't try to make it seem like a parody. They right. Just, it's just there to, to light a fire. Well, they just, yeah. it's clickbait. Yeah. Clickbait is a huge issue across the board. It's a huge issue with sites even that I agree with. There's a lot of progressive sites that do it. They, they write these really inflammatory titles, and then you read it. Like, right. I can't stand the, you know, and, and you won't believe what happened next. It's like, what? no, I, I'm not even go there now. Just leave me alone. One of them was about peanut butter and jelly being racist. And I was like, what the, what the fuck is this? And so, of course, everybody's tweeting it and retweeting it. And if you actually read into it, it's like, I think some editor just jazzed up this idea of three yeah. meals a day and peanut butter and jelly and, you know, and what, what, where, this, where does three meals a day come from? What is the idea? And then someone actually put in the, you know, the byline, is it, in fact, racist? Like, oh, what the fuck? And then everybody's, they're saying that three meals a day is racist. And then you start tweeting. It's clickbait. They yeah, fuck you. Yeah, they yeah. just, and it's, 
It's just this mad rush to get people to read your shit, right. and in doing so, you've sacrificed all credibility. Yeah, and, and you can be inflammatory about peanuts without being mm -hmm. stupid. I mean, yes. peanuts are somewhat dangerous, uh, you know, people's health, potentially. Now, why don't I read about peanuts that said that it wasn't always the case, and that one of the real concerns about peanut allergies is that keeping kids from peanuts when they're very young, because you're worried about peanut allergies, could in fact be causing peanut allergies. Yeah, there was a recently a study that um, found that by doing a manipulation of gut bacteria, they could eliminate peanut allergies in mice. Really? Yeah. So it seems to be some core, uh, you know, functional gut thing that's gone awry to produce peanut allergies in, in these individuals. This doesn't taste that bad. Which one's that, the caffeine one? Yeah. That's the, the worst original. one. That's the, that's, oh, the, really? that's the most bitter of all three, yeah. Because caffeine is a pretty bitter molecule. Oh, it is? Like it has a taste to it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, try, try a decaf versus calf coffee and you'll be able to taste the difference. There's a, a bitterness under the caffeine, caffeine flavor. Yeah, there's like a milder sort of a taste. Yeah. What do you think about, like, like, you ever try that Kopi Luwak? That no, I have not tried the, it. The bean that comes from a Civic's butt. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a problem paying seventy bucks for a cup of coffee. First of all, mm. uh, but um, I have not yet tried the Kopi Luwak. Yeah, I bought a bag of it once. Well, I bought it um, uh, at a place, and it was really smooth. If you haven't heard of it, what it is? Uh, there's an animal called a Civic that is like some type of cat, like a actually. weasel. Yeah, you know, it's, but I think it's in the cat family. And they eat uh, coffee beans and then shit them out. Yeah. And the farmers didn't want to waste these coffee beans, so they would p p literally pick them out of the dung yep. of the Civic and put it into, you know, they would roast it. Mm -hmm. And it somehow or another, stomach acids do something yeah, pre -digested, to the bean. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, makes it, like, yeah. really smooth. Yeah, all the enzymes. But does it affect the caffeine content? I don't know. I don't know. My guess is the roasting is really where that matters the most because you have to bring the oils out of the bean to the surface and caramelize them or oxidize them to produce the, the flavor you're looking for. So my guess, and the longer you roast, the, the, the more the caffeine goes down. And non-roasted uh, coffee beans have some sort of antioxidant effect as well, right? Yeah, the Isn't green coffee bean helping? thing, uh, the chloro, what's the word, chloro, I forget what the compound is. Yeah, but there's some antioxidants uh, in, I mean, Green, brown, whatever coffee you have, Westerners get more antioxidants from coffee, I think, than all other sources combined. That's incredible. You know, we drink a huge amount of coffee, but there's a there's a lot of benefits. I mean, I'm a big fan of the of the coffee. Uh, but it gets demonized, doesn't it? It sure does. I mean, and, and there's and there's some drawbacks. You know, coffee would not be considered a strict nootropic. I mean, my my definition for the word nootropic is improving cognition, supporting output with no appreciable side effects. So coffee does not fit. That. Doesn't 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 fit that bar. But do I use it? Absolutely. I mean, I wake up in the morning with too much blood in my caffeine stream. You know, race for the pour over and make one first thing. Well, you know, I love it as a ritual. Yeah. It's like one of those things. I just love a warm cup of coffee yep. in the morning. It's just like it feels like this is a nice way to relax your way into the day. Absolutely. And the ritual piece of it should not I mean, it's, it's a really big part of it for me. It gives you a chance to be mindful. Um, mm -hmm. When folks come into my office for QEEGs, I ask them to abstain from coffee that day or tea or whatever. And then when they're done, I hand them a you know handcrafted cup of coffee that I've made for them. Handcrafted is one of my least favorite expressions. Is it really? Yep, I'm really getting pissed. Is it is it redundant? Is it the? Uh... Well, it's just one of those things. This is a handcrafted burger. Yeah. Here's hand. We well, make, well, serve handcrafted right. cocktails. I make I make the coffee for my clients when right. they're when they're done their brain map. The the doctor brings you a cup of coffee because it's. Let me give you some good coffee. My my secret stash. Oh, what kind of what kind of coffee do you use? Um, I use a mix of small origin organic, you know, batches. I have them delivered to me from a couple of different places in the country. Yeah. So there's a place there's... up in Portland, Oregon, that sh ships me my little, you know, stash. So. Oh, that's nice. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I have uh, a, a bunch of different favorites. Uh -huh. Like the coffees do have a different flavor profile. Oh yeah, yeah. sure, sure, sure. There's some interesting ones out there. You know, um, I had this guy Peter Giuliani, Giuliano, Giuliano. Giuliano. He's um, a coffee expert, mm -hmm. and uh, he told me that all coffee originates from Ethiopia. All of it. Initially? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that... Very uh, narrow part mm -hmm. of the world it grew, it grew in initially, yeah. Yeah, and that from there, they started taking it to all these different parts of the world, where mm -hmm. like Arabica, 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 how do you say it? Arabica. Arabica, beans. Yeah. It's, they took it to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Know, they took yeah. it to all these different parts of... Yeah. Uh, South America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then they started growing it in all these different places. But we always can think of, you know, Colombia as being like where right. that dude Juan Valdez lives. And he's, he's growing right. all the awesome coffee. I, I actually prefer <laughs> African coffees to South American typically. 
um, you know, a little more complexity, a little darker uh, flavors in them typically. Well, he brought me some Ethiopian coffee that tasted like lemons. Wow. It was really interesting. It was like, he doesn't drink it with, with uh, any cream or anything uh -huh. in it, so it was just black coffee. Yeah. And it had this like really lemony taste to it. It was hmm. really good. Interesting. Really good and really unusual. I was like, whoa. And there's a bunch of different weird flavors, like Kona is one of my favorites mm -hmm. from Hawaii. Hawaii yep, sure, sure. Hawaii has some really interesting flavors, and you go, like, what is causing this stuff? It's just altitude. Mm-hmm. Altitude, the water soil. The growing in the soil. Yeah, like yeah. Cuban cigars. Right. Have a very distinct flavor. Which we can now legally bring back into the country, finally. Like 100 bucks worth, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for now. I mean, that, yeah. that's going to you know widen, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, I'm sure it will. Like, wait, wait, officially, you can only go now if you're part of an education group. Oh, I'm teaching people shit all the time. Man. There you I'm go. part of an education nice. group. Nice. And you having you on this program is educational for the folks that are listening. So Great. I think I'm a... Who's to say I'm not? You want to go to Cuba? We should we... Fuck nice. yeah, dude. Let's nice. do it. Let's drive one of those old cars you have down there. That's they, right. That's yeah, right. they have all these 1950s cars from before the embargo. Yeah, because they, they haven't been able to get new cars. Uh, yeah. Western cars, anyway, since then. But it, in, it's sort of like a real knock on consumerism, because they do a great job with these cars. These cars are in amazing shape. Mm -hmm. There was this image that I saw recently online of all these people driving these, like, 1950s, early 1960 cars, yeah. and they're beautiful. Sure. They're really well kept. Yeah. I was like, that is fascinating. Like, we have this idea that cars, we have to get a new car every year, the new yeah. cars, or we have to have a new model every year, yeah. rather. The new cars have to have a substantial improvement in all areas of performance, and braking, and yep. gadgets, and all this different jazz. But they also, you know, like a, a modern car today would not last 50 years on an island. It's true. You know, too many, too many complexities, too many small uh, mm -hmm. electronics, mm -hmm. it just would fall apart. You know, the reason you know, they have 50s cars in Cuba is because you can remanufacture and replace those parts and keep them running. Yeah. In a way that you would not be able to with like a Prius or, you know, some modern, you know, fuel injected thing. Especially a Prius. Anything that has batteries, yeah. that's, that's a huge, huge issue is the lithium ion yeah. and the batteries. The cobalt. Yeah. That stuff wears out. Cadmium. Yeah, that's one thing that people aren't taking into consideration when they think about the fact that they're driving some eco-friendly vehicle. Mm -hmm. Well, it's eco-friendly for right here. Right. Not necessarily eco-friendly for where it's being pulled out of the ground. Yeah, I Africa. saw I saw an article. I think it was inflammatory more than real, but it pointed out that the ownership cost and the impact, environmental impact of a Prius versus a Hummer were equivalent. Yeah. Because a Prius has a 100,000 uh, mile lifespan and there's all these really expensive mine battery components that go into it. Where a Hummer has like a 300,000 mile lifespan and it's just an old fashioned, you know, traditionally engineered car. Right. So there's, there's a, uh, you know. That's sort of disingenuous though, because who the fuck drives a Hummer for 300,000 miles? Totally. And, and, you know, if you dig into the math, some of it is a little bit biased, it doesn't seem to work all that well. But it's not simply that because you drive a car that is ele electric, it's not only, you know, that's not the only benefit on, you know, you not buying gas is not the only benefit of having a hybrid. It would be amazing, though, to see what would happen if you took every car in Los Angeles and replaced it with an electric car. First of all, there'd be people with dead batteries everywhere. <laughs> there'd be assholes yes. that forgot to charge their car, blocking the road off. Yes. And because you just, you don't have the access to charging. It takes too long. People are late for work. Mm -hmm. They don't have that half an hour to get that 50% charge, yeah, whatever yeah, the fuck yeah. it takes. But the sky would look different. It might. I mean, the, the air quality has improved pretty much every year since Reagan in L.A., right? Like, Reagan was the peak of the horrible smog. I have to tell folks that, you know, when I go back to visit the Northeast where I'm from, that, oh, yeah, we don't actually make jokes about L.A. smog. It's like, well, it's actually not that bad. There's, the air quality is pretty darn good, especially where I live in, you know, West L.A. It's mm, Where you're getting the wave from the... The ocean air. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. The, the smog, you know, when I first moved to L.A. in 2005, I, was, I rode cross country in a motorcycle, and I was coming down to the San Fernando Valley, and there's this layer of black and orange sludge that I drove down into, you know? Um, even that's happening less and less, I think. So I, I think the, the sort of Southern California, you know, smog uh, trope is really overblown these days. Well, the smog laws that they put in place and the smog uh, screens that you have mm -hmm. to put your car through, they're pretty substantial. They I mean, are. They're, doing, they're doing a good job as far as that. Yeah. And it makes it very difficult for you to take cars post-1975. Yeah. Pre-1975, they're exempt. Yep. But post-1975 cars, like there's a lot of them that have a huge issue getting smogged, mm -hmm. getting smog yep. cleared. Yeah, I have, a, I have a one that's post that, but it's a diesel, so it's exempt. Oh, stinky. No, it runs on vegetable oil. Oh, you're one of those guys. I have, I have, I have a couple of vehicles. One's a veggie oil uh, 
diesel and one's a motorcycle. Yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a traditional gas car too. But now, when you say it runs on vegetable oil, where do you get your vegetable oil? Um, I haven't been driving it too much, so nowhere recently. But I have a friend from uh, Inglewood who had a small company. He delivers it. Uh, and he would deliver, uh, you know, gallons of, you know, sort of reclaimed waste vegetable oil that he would clean. Yeah, they kick it. I had so. a buddy of mine who converted. He bought an old Mercedes, yeah. an old diesel Mercedes. Those are the best ones to convert. Yeah, and he converted it to kitchen oil, yep. and he would get it from restaurants. He yeah, would buy yeah. their kitchen oil. Exactly. Now, these days, I mean, 20 years ago, you could do that. These days, there's entire companies that have relationships with the Japanese, Chinese restaurants to do this and to resell it uh, as a commercial company. but What kind of um, gas mileage do you get with one of those cars? I mean, I'm, I was getting more than 30 miles a gallon with diesel still as an a mid early 80s car. And I think I lose one mile per gallon on veggie oil. So instead of like 30, you'd get like 29 like, miles a gallon. Yeah, it's 31 to 30 or something. Yeah. And is it a large vehicle you're talking about? Yeah, it's like a 300 CD Mercedes, you know, 3,500 pound vehicle, big, heavy, two-door Mercedes, but still a big one. That's um, not very heavy. 3,500? Is that really heavy? Compared to a modern car? Sure. Really? Yeah. What do you think a modern car weighs? Um, 18 to 2,500 would be my guess. That's crazy. No. That, you, that's like a really, really light sports car. Like a, okay. like a 1970 Porsche with everything stripped out, with no radio, no heat. If I don't you're know, lucky, I don't, I don't know if that's true. Cause you can I, get I had down a, to 2,200 pounds. I had a early 80s Oldsmobile Delta 88, big old mm -hmm. land yacht, and that thing yeah. was only 4,200 pounds. That doesn't make sense either. Are you sure? Yeah. Because yeah. I have a, a, a 911, uh, a Porsche 911 GT3 RS, which is the lightest uh -huh. model they yep. make. It's 3,000 pounds. Okay. And that's very light. It's extremely light. I mean, they, 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 it has carbon fiber seats. They strip out all the, the sound deadening. And it's like, you they sure make it's it as 2, light as possible. Pounds? No, I'm 100% positive. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm actually pretty deep in this world of lightning cars. Okay. Like, they drill into foot pedals right, to make right, the car right. lighter. lighter yeah. They drill into the handle of the door. Like, to take a time. Have you ever seen a 1972 911? Yeah. It's a tiny car. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah much smaller it. than a 911 of today. Yeah. If you're lucky, you get one of those down to 2,200 okay. pounds. If you're really a fucking psycho, you can get it down to like maybe 1,800, but you have to use carbon fiber fenders, fiberglass fenders, things along those lines. You you really compromise a lot of uh, no comfort at all. It's okay. like no, the well, dashboard's I, my, stripped uh, down. My Mercedes, I'm not sure then what it weighs, but it's a heavy car. It's not, right. a, it's not a light, low-key, tiny car. Well, it could be 3,500 pounds, but I mean like a, a BMW M3, for instance. Instance, yeah. which is a sporty car. Yeah, I have a I have a Mini Cooper modern one that's you know that's a small car, lightweight. That's very lightweight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but a, an M3, which is not a big car, is thirty nine hundred pounds. Wow, I, I'm surprised. Yeah, most people are. Yeah, the, most people think their cars are lighter than they really are. Like a, for instance, like a Dodge Challenger. You see those new mm -hmm. Dodge Challengers? Mm -hmm. You're looking at about forty five hundred pounds. Wow, it's yeah. huge. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't look like it would be. No, not at all. Mm. Not at all. Well, you're dealing with V8 engines, metal frames. Yeah. Interesting. All that jazz. Yeah. People would be surprised at how heavy your shit is. Like, I, I have a Lexus X SUV. You mm -hmm. know, those big, that's like 6,000 pounds, that fucker. Oh, my God. Big fat pig. So maybe they're getting heavier again, too, then, as, as uh, you know, we bolt more things onto these vehicles. Well, they're trying to make a lot more cars out of aluminum now. Mm -hmm. uh, like, Ford has done that. Yeah, they just released a new truck with a, a aluminum frame, right? Yes. They've done that with their F-150, and they've reduced it by more than 700 pounds. Oh, wow. Was it steel before, I assume? You know, yeah. Steel frame? But it's amazing, because the new aluminums that they're using are just as strong, if not stronger, in some ways than steel. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're substantially lighter. I mean, mm -hmm. It's really incredible benefits as far as, like, gas mileage... All those things, yeah. The, the way they construct them is a little bit different, but so far, no uh, detriment. The new Range Rover is doing the same thing. The new Range Rover is cut somewhere between six and 700 pounds from their cars as well. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you know, regardless of the, Doesn't of the, matter. Of the weight yeah. of the MBZ, it's, uh, you know, I'm still getting 30 miles to the gallon on, on diesel. Well, diesel's way, way more efficient, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's compression. The compression, it, does, it doesn't explode the fuel, it burns and releases the gases. So it's not a, it's not an explosive decompression. So it's much more efficient. Neil Young has a, like a ranch in Northern California where he grows his own plants, to converts make them into yeah. biodiesel and powers his own vehicles sure. with his own diesel creation. Closed loop. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I love it. He's, he's a pretty amazing guy. Oh, he's the best. Yeah. 
He's a fascinating dude. He had some weird project he was doing, though, that everybody was like, all right, good luck with that. He was trying to make some super expensive MP3 player that recreated the sound of, of uh, vinyl or as close to it as possible. Okay. And he had a, a GoFundMe or a Kickstarter or some shit like that. And people were like, what? First of all, no one's giving Neil Young money. It's not happening. Dude, you're rich as fuck. Right, you got, right. you got a thousand acre ranch in Northern California you're making your own diesel. All right. You spend your money. Dude. Right, right, right. So like that was problematic. But it was also like the the shape of this thing. It was like a you know those Toblerone, whatever mm -hmm. those chocolate bars? Mm -hmm. That's what it looked like. Like a pyramid shape but long, you know? And uh, you pull it pull it up, Jamie. This is a fucking disaster. I mean, it never went anywhere. Nobody, right, nobody right. gave a shit about it. But the idea behind it was to create a richer sound that sort of emulates the actual recording, the original recording right, right. of the of the MP3. So it reproduces take, it without the the lossy sort of compression. Yeah. So to take this compressed sound and convert it into something that has like more depth, mm -hmm. more richness to. Sony has a new thing that they just announced too. Here, here it is, the Pono highest resolution. See how it looks like a chocolate bar? That little oh yeah weird fucking shaped thing. Is anybody buying those things, Jamie? I don't think so. No. Nobody's buying that fucking thing, Neil Young. How dare you? How dare you waste your time, you genius. Looks kind of like a Nintendo... Uh, yeah. Something. You know, game controller or something. Yeah, it's it's a very odd-looking device. And it kind of got trumped recently because Sony just released some new version of a Walkman. It's much thicker. It's heavy. It looks like a cell phone. It looks mm -hmm. almost like an iPhone. Mm -hmm. But it's only for mp3s and this sony version is just much much it's uh m much more powerful as mm -hmm. far as uh its ability to much more powerful than your phone rather i don't know if it's more powerful than neil young's creation <laughs> okay we're getting away from things here um mindfulness i mindfulness, want to talk to you about yeah, mindfulness yeah. What, what do you mean by mindfulness when you say mindfulness that's one of those terms that like people go oh i'm not religious but i'm spiritual you know oh, i'm practicing mindfulness it's I love it as a as, yeah. a, as a thought, but I, yeah. I don't like all the baggage that's attached yeah, to it. Yeah, and I think that most people who aren't doing it don't know what it is. Right. Uh, and I say, oh, you know, you know, developing meditation practice will be good for you. And I get the response, oh, I can never shut off my mind. Well, that isn't the point <laughs> of meditating. It's like, you know, the point of going to the gym is not to be strong. The point is to lift weights. Like, there's, there's an exercise. Meditation is a practice you do, and you might get to a quieter mind, but the practice is not quieting your mind. Right. So, to answer your question, mindfulness is paying attention to the present moment in a specific way on purpose. Now, that sounds simple. It but is. It's, it's, but it's not really simple in practice, is it, for most folks? It is. It, it actually is. Well, there's, there's many different types of meditation, right? The, the classic meditations of uh, Vipassana, Samatha, Metta, these are all fairly similar in that you pick something, some anchor to hold your attention on. And then simply you notice when you've drifted. Since you have a mind, it will drift. It'll get, you know, fantasize, dream, remember, wish, plan. And when you notice you're not holding that attention focus, that anchor, you release whatever, whatever it is you've gotten distracted by and bring your attention back to the anchor. And that's the wrap of meditation. That's it. Oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be thinking about this sound or my, watching my breath or he, listening to one you know, note or something in a, in a music play. Oh, I've gotten distracted. Oh, let it go. Not now. Back to the focus. Again and again and again and again. And that's the entirety of most classic meditation is noticing when you've gotten distracted, you've left your anchor of your attention, put down the distraction, go back to the anchor. So That's it. it's not a loss when you get distracted. Not only is it not a loss, if you aren't getting distracted, you probably aren't alive. You know, if you have a mind, it will get distracted. That's what they do. You know, your mind pays attention to your pains, your distractions, your wishes, your fantasies, your memories. I mean, it's doing all of these things. If, you, if you're able to sit down and shut your mind off, you probably don't have one. So when people talk about the the difficulty that they have in meditation, you think they probably get to that step, and they go, "God, I can't do it." And they and yeah, and they're and they're basically saying, "I'm not any good at it." Instead of saying, "Well, being good at it or not is not the point. The point is doing it." Mm. You know, if you went to the gym and pumped iron and did a bunch of bench presses, were you good at it? Well, maybe right. you do, maybe like a, a personal record or something. But going versus not going is what matters, not 
you know, critiquing necessarily every little bit of what you do. Some people are terrified, though, of silence. Yeah. Terrified of silence and just being, sitting alone, doing nothing. It's like, no! They would yeah. rather climb a fucking mountain in their underwear yep. than just sit alone in a room, cross-legged, and by yeah. themselves. Yeah. And just yeah. think, okay, I'm going to leave you here for three hours, you can't talk. I just want you well, to breathe in. Well, the three hour those. thing is scary too, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you tell people, here's how you should meditate. And, you know, they go to a meditation class, like a Buddhist center, and they have to sit there for an hour and a half. That's a big ask initially. So I often tell folks, 20 minutes. You know, and even, even that can be a big ask for some folks. So I say, you know, take your first five minutes and do a concentration practice. Take a very narrow uh, focus. Like, watch the sensation of air crossing your up, upper lip. Just pay attention to that tickle. That's it very narrow, tight, spatial focus, and do that for five minutes. By the end of that time, your mind's probably a little more stable. And then do what I call an awareness or insight practice. Watch more rhythmic things like your breath rise and fall or the sound of traffic going by the road or something. And when you say your mind is more stable, like how yeah. so? Well, you have less random things popping up in your mind after doing some concentration practice. There's le it feels less busy, the less of the monkey mind chatter. It's still there, but it's a little less insistent when you've done some concentration practice. I mean, concentrating on anything sort of redirects uh, your attention resources and what you're thinking about. And if what you're really thinking about is simply attending, focusing for its own sake, then you build those resources and build more strength and resources in focusing. And so then later on, when you're walking around the world, you have a more spacious mind, you have some space between your thoughts, you're less automatically reactive, you're not going to cut somebody off in traffic and, you know, pick them the bird. Um, these are all things that happen as a consequence of developing more resources. So what you do on the cushion or, you know, wherever you happen to meditate translates to less reactivity, more sustained focus, better attention, better sleep, less anxiety, less anger. But you aren't practicing all those things. Those things come from having more stable attention, more stable executive function. I sort of feel like a lot of people operate on momentum yeah. and that they kind of, that momentum oftentimes is like nipping at their heels yep. and they can never rest. It's like yeah. the momentum of all their past actions and thoughts yep. and the things that they have to deal with in their life, their bills, their responsibilities, all that stuff is sort of pushing you. Sure. And when they go to bed, they're like, their head is still spinning. I yep. can't stop thinking. I got to keep I'm, I'm, my so mind. Shut is their rushing. mind off, and all this background noise starts to rise to the yeah. surface. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. A meditation is something that can quiet that. Absolutely. It, it will help you choose how you react. I mean, I, the, the, the phrase I use is intention versus momentum. You learn to choose and to act versus react and to be. You know, act from a place of choice and control uh, instead of always, you know, reeling based on your environment. Do you use sensory deprivation tanks? I have. Uh, I have not. It might be fun to do, you know, considering I have a sort of ecstatic shamanic You have? You have history. not? I have not. I have not, have not. I've not used float tanks, no. I've never, I've never, never. done a float tank. That's crazy. I know, right? Um, I've never, uh, never ended up in one, uh, really. I've been interested in it, but never quite happened. So. How does a guy like you not get into that? That seems really well, you bizarre can't, you to You can't me. try everything. I mean, there's all kinds of things that I've gotten into. Yeah, but that's the motherfucker. I can't believe you haven't tried that. Yeah. I've, had, I've had one in my basement for the past 15 years. Uh-huh. 13? And 12, is it a you know, body, body temperature, Epsom lie. salts kind of thing? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, um, I started doing it in the uh, early 2000s. I, um, I went to a place and tried it out for the first time, and I was hooked. Mm -hmm. I you know, read about it, seen the Altered States movie, got yeah, excited yeah, about yeah. it, read John Lilly's book, The Deep Self, and... Um, if you've never done it, it's it's meditation times a hundred. Sure, because you don't feel your body. You like literally detach from right, your body. Right, right. Once you become relaxed enough to, to you do the same meditation practices, concentrate. Mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm, I concentrate with, on my breath. That's mm -hmm. what I do. In with the good, out with the bad, mm -hmm. and I do it over a long period of time. Like I, I like to do a one minute breath. I uh -huh. like to do one minute in and one minute out because oh, it's wow. very difficult. And yeah, it requires yeah, a lot of yeah. discipline. Yeah. It requires a lot of discipline not to just exhale all your air sure. right away. But in doing so, it, it, that's like the, the base. That's, what, that's how I build up my – and then anything after that is easy. Mm -hmm. And um, the focus – on the the breath takes away from freaking out about the fact that you're floating around this tank 
and you don't feel your body. And the, the absence of sensory perception, you're really not getting anything in there. You're getting a little bit of movement. Sometimes your body will develop like itches. Mm-hmm. Like, God, I got to itch my face. You gotta, and it's really, you don't, it's not, you don't, you didn't get bit by a fucking mosquito. You're just freaking out. It's like, right. it's random sensory. Yeah. Your brain's freaking out because it's not getting any input. So it starts creating problems. Sure. There's, there's lots of ways you can sort of trick the brain into producing input like that, um, even without you know climbing into a float tank. Uh, the simplest hack for that is probably um, something called Gansfeld classes. Take a ping pong, cut it in half, trim the edges so they aren't sharp, and essentially make a pair of goggles where you're covering each eye with the ping pong half, ping pong ball, mm-hmm. and then sit and look through the, the white balls um, at, a, at a white wall that you're projecting light onto, so there's some indirect light and keep your eyes open and stare at the inside of these curved spaces. You can't resolve distance. You can't resolve a flat surface. And after a few minutes, you start hallucinating. Oh, interesting. It's the same thing you experience. I'm showing you have some, some hallucinations when your visions, when you're deep in your, in your float tank, too, yeah, right? Yeah, you certainly do. The same exact thing that's triggered within moments sometimes for some people, a few minutes anyways, with Gonsfeld. Because the eyes being open and trying to look but not seeing any surface. It's a very similar phenomenon, I bet, to your float tank. Yeah, I bet it is. The difference being that in the float tank, one of the benefits of it is the fact that you, there's, in the absence of sensory depri- or the sensory input, it seems like your brain has way more resources. So yeah. it seems like problems seem to be easier to fix. Yep, yep. They seem, solutions seem to be more apparent. You just have a better understanding of things. Yeah, you know, I think why I haven't gotten into float tanks is because I have other you know, ecstatic, me, ecstatic meaning taking you out of ordinary reality. Mm-hmm. I have other techniques that work really well for me and that I, I, I tend to use, you know, like, like rhythmic movement until your mind, you know, mm-hmm. shifts. Right. Um, and then for technology assisted stuff, I mean, I, I run a neurofeedback center. I can put you in a state in half an hour, you know, with wires on your head. Mm-hmm. And so if I want to dial in a specific state, I will dial in a specific state for myself. This is a massive benefit to that tank. I would really love you to experience it and then hear what your your thoughts on it are. Sure. Because it's yeah. I'll send you down to the float lab in Venice. You're sure. in the west side. Yeah, I live in Culver City. So. Yeah, the float lab is the spot. I mean, this guy Crash, who's created these tanks, has got the most advanced tanks in oh, the world. Oh, I, I have a, f- a friend of a friend actually. I, I uh, I've heard of him. So. Yeah, he's a master when it comes to that. He's really when when the entire float world was building these flimsy mm-hmm. plastic mm-hmm. sort of I, shitty I, things. I remember those things. Yeah. Yeah, he came up with this giant steel walled structure that looks like a meat locker. Okay. His are far more insulated. They retain heat better. Mm-hmm. The linings are far thicker. He mm-hmm. uses the mm-hmm. same mm-hmm. linings that they use when they make koi ponds. Oh, nice. Like everything he built to the 10th degree. Yeah, Just, I'm interested in checking it out. Uh, might be some way we could do underwater. Oh, your, your head's not immersed, is it? No. no, well, it's under half water. Your okay. body's floating, right? So if you're lying on your back, I would love to do your water an EEG, up, but you yeah. can't do EEG underwater. So we're wet electrodes. So <sighs> would, couldn't you develop some uh, electrodes? Where are you attaching the electrodes? Scalp. Scalp all over the scalp? Yeah. Different. Could you pro? It's a could grid. You keep it? To the frontal area, it wouldn't, would it it wouldn't give you thing? the. It wouldn't be the thing with EEG is to compare your results to any existing literature. You have to record the same spots or the same distribution of spots. Would so. there be a way to do it inside some sort of a diver's cap? There might be. Yeah, exactly. There are a few. Uh, there are a few ways that this might be accomplished because I've seen EEGs done on actual divers, like on mm. scuba divers. So there probably are ways of like electrodes that can get wet that you can sort of seal against the scalp with colloidal, you know, gels and things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would love to see what happens to brains under that, you know, altered state. Yeah, I would love to see you try it. I'd love to see you do some tests on it. Crash is also developing some sort of a weird video component to his tanks where he has uh, engineered these screens to have the lowest amount of light emission that you can possibly uh, have while still seeing the uh-huh. image. Uh-huh. So that these images, because you're in complete silence, complete darkness, yeah. I mean, you, you don't, there's no light in there at all. So having this incredibly minimal amount of light on these screens, you can see the, the images, but you don't see the television. Right. You don't see the, right. The, right. the screen itself. And he believes that in the absence of sensory input, your, your brain having more resources, you can take in information better. So you can mm-hmm. learn quicker. It's pro- I mean, I think it's probably very likely. Yeah, you know, less yeah. distraction. Yeah. Like, and also you can do things if you did things from first-person perspective. If mm-hmm. you had videos of people learning things from first-person perspective, it could sync up in your oh, mind. Interesting. Yeah. You know. 
Interesting. It must happen to mirror neurons in some way, then. Well, it's just theoretical at this point. Yeah, I don't yeah. think he's actually achieved it. I mean, he's he's. I know he's got the tank set up right now with this uh, this video. Maybe you could. Take yeah, a look it sounds at like it we need to do is as add a biofeedback component to it, where what you're seeing is contingent on your brain moving in specific directions. Mm, yeah. And then you could actually could. I mean, if the float tank's putting you into this receptive state and deep state quickly, and it sounds like it is, with biofeedback, you could probably you know like incredibly powerfully just move people across uh, state shifts. Well, it's the only atmosphere that I know of, the only environment where your body is literally untethered from your, your mind. mind. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, you don't feel anything. Yeah, you're, yeah. It feels like you're flying, like you're floating through the universe. And you, there's a weird illusion of motion that you get when you're in that thing. When you, hmm. you're floating for a while, you feel like you're flying. Like you feel like you're flying forward. Interesting. Like you're moving. There's a feeling of movement. Can you feel gravity? I mean, you're aware, no. of, you're aware of it? Okay. You're totally floating. Because of the fact that there's a thousand pounds of salt in this water, yeah, and the yeah. water being 93.5 degrees right. when you float, or 94, some people, you, you're floating so in you're this. very buoyant. You're not, you're not feeling anything. Yeah. The water becomes your air. The oh. air becomes your skin. It's all one thing, and you're, you're just no more input, and you just... Cool. Yeah. Total it's a, darkness. It's, it's a, something I'd love to hear more about. I just what don't understand how you haven't fucked with that yet. That, does, that seems like something right up your alley. Um, it does actually. I, it's probably just a function of I, I, I'm, a, I'm one guy. Right. You right. Know? There's too many things going on. I mean, on. I've I lived a lot, a lot of different lives, a lot of different careers. It sounds like it, you, you crazy know? shaman, wacky tattooed That's right. man. I mean, I started grad school at age 35. <laughs> Did you really? You know, uh, and had other careers before that. Like, and, what other careers? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, I worked inpatient psychiatric crisis for many years. Uh, that worked, must have been fun. Yeah, that was kind of crazy. Um, the most violent hospital in the state of Massachusetts. Oh, Christ. Uh, we were doing 5, 10, 15 restraints a shift when I first got there. Wow. And after a year, I took over training people how to do restraints. And That's we were... why you started lifting weights? No, I was, I was actually really into time. Aikido back then. Oh, okay. And uh, that's about safe, management of safe energy, or not getting hurt when, energy, mm -hmm. when people are throwing punches, basically. And uh, I took over training the restraint team, and after another year, we were down to like one a month. So it was, some of it was the expectations we were setting on the patients in the hospital, you know? Mm. The conflict was, was there. Right. Like oftentimes, people discuss that when they talk about police violence, that the much of the violence that they get involved in yeah. could be mitigated if they had a better way of communicating. Sure. People. Absolutely. Um, so I did that. Um, I uh, my first jobs were working on farms in a little farming town in the Northeast. Picked berries. Hmm. Uh, I um, was a baker and caterer for a few years. I worked in uh, residential homes with retarded and pr multiply disabled adults. Um, worked in high tech for several years. Worked in a middleware database company for a few years. Uh, worked for a neurofeedback guy, worked for an MRI imaging center doing uh, prediction of depression relapse based on brain changes when people mm. withdrew their meds. Um, you know, so really a pretty broad, you know, high tech, human services, and then now I'm sort of combining the two. Uh, How much work do you do with people that have uh, encountered traumatic brain injuries? I, I'm, I'm more than I thought I would be. Um, you know, neurofeedback is largely tuning circuits that exist. Um, and TBIs, traumatic head injuries, traumatic brain injuries, are often different architecture. The brain has been physically traumatized. Um, some TBI people, I can make really quick changes. I have one client right now. She came to see me. She was having some tremors on opposite side from the head injury. She was having a lot of impulsivity, which is a pretty standard thing when you're you know, head injured. Yeah, impulsivity is a weird one, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty dramatic um, often for head injuries. And, uh, you know, she's now finishing her 30 sessions. She's, you know, gone off all of her meds. She's no longer oh. on anti anticonvulsant. She's not on any, any anti-impulsivity uh, meds and no sore sleep meds. So her brain changed very, very quickly uh, and, and sort of in the direction I was hoping it would. And it, it sort of just did what I asked it to. Um, I had a client last year who came to see me and I just couldn't get his brain moving. There was just too much going on. Um, so I, I so what do you mean by I couldn't get his brain like I, I couldn't get his frequencies to train up or down um, enough. I couldn't get his symptoms to shift. He was you know get worn out at you know noon every day, and he was really impulsive and all the standard TBI stuff. Um, so I think I've worked in the past decade with about seven or eight TBI people, and you know three of them were dramatic responders, and a couple were tough you know tough movers. Cause, so this guy that you couldn't get yeah. him to move, what did you want to? Um, I, you know, we, he ended up um, going overseas to teach English. He sort of he had a, an end to the time that I had him, because he was 
going to the next job, which was overseas. Um, so I only had him for like six or eight weeks or something. So had I had him, I would have said, look, let me stop billing you, which is what I do when I don't make results. It doesn't happen very often. But I said, let me stop billing you and then just keep training and just keep trying different things until I find something that works for your specific brain. And so you take some of the pressure off them by not making it financial. Yeah, exactly. So I signed people up for like a 30 session package, which costs some money, you know, costs about a little over 4K. And 90% um, or more of people, their brains do exactly what I ask and they're, and they're really happy with the results. Does insurance cover that? Sometimes. Um, depends. You know, uh, um, alternatives, which is where I do uh, neurofeedback, is not a provider for any insurance. So if you've got a PPO or something, we can often submit against it for partial reimbursements or things. Um, the addiction side of alternatives, we actually are getting pretty good coverage these days. Um, Dr. Jaffe and Kern just got the center. Uh, certified as an outpatient um, partial hospitalization day program. So that, 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 that's the non-12 step uh, in treatment program we have there. So this gentleman that you weren't getting results with, yeah. what was his issue? He had some sort of a concussion, massive... Yeah, a car accident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, and he you know, went coma for many weeks, lost a big chunk of his brain in the front. And so oh. he had massive impulsivity because the frontal lobe, again, is your inhibitor. It so like as far as drinking, sexual things, uh, yeah, all, speeding. I mean, it was sort of like acquired ADHD. He mm. sort of acquired it in his mid 40s because of this head injury where he had no self-control, said whatever, he, you know, inappropriate, um, you know, and then he would get worn out by one o'clock every day, noon, one o'clock, he just was just done, which is really common in TBI just to not having any mental stamina. And so for him it was, let's get your sleep better because he wasn't sleeping well, let's make your daytime energy better, and let's get you less impulsive with the goals. And those things all moved, but they moved, you know, a fraction of what I really wanted them to move. And most people, I mean, the reason why it was so frustrating is for most people, neurofeedback is sort of a, you know, it's my silver bullet. I can do lots of things with it. I expect that nine uh, or more than nine out of 10 people will just, you know, their brains will do what I ask. Mm -hmm. um, even if they're dramatically impaired, you know, profoundly, uh, you know, self-stimming autistics, people with major PTSD or major alcoholism or a lot of a really common presentation these days is um, people that have been on sleeping meds for decades and they aren't working and they can't sleep. And, but they're still on massive amounts of sleeping, sleeping meds. Ambien type things. Yeah, all kinds of things. What are your thoughts on those? Um, the short answer is there's no such thing as a sleeping med. None of these sleep drugs make you sleep. They all are hypnotics. They, they put you in a trance-like state. They sedate you into a hypnosis or hypnotic state. And then if you're tired and the normal sleep reflex is there, it takes over and you fall asleep. But it didn't put you in a sleep state. It put you in a hypnotic state, which is very different than a sleep state. I have some friends that have real problems with those things. They have to take them all the time, or they do take them all yeah. the time. They think they have to take them and all And they the don't time. work after taking them for a while. So people come to see me and say, I've been taking sleep drugs for you know, 10, 20 years, and I haven't slept well in 10 years. And so I start training up their frequencies that cause deeper sleep at night, more relaxation, you know, there's, so a sleep architecture is maintained by specific frequencies in the brain, sleep spindles. And so I'll train those up, make them stronger, so they're able to fall asleep more easily, stay asleep more easily, wake up more refreshed. So I have a friend, and he, he takes two a day. Yeah. He takes two of those fucking ambient things at night. Oh. He scares the shit out of me. Yeah. Everyone's always worried he's not going to wake up one day. Yeah. Um, what would you do to that guy? I would say, you know, how comfortable are you, you know, reducing your ambient? And usually the answer is, I can't. So okay, let's move. Okay, on. what if? Okay, let's forget him because yeah. he's a junkie. Let's uh, let's go. I mean, ambient junkie. He's probably a junkie for some other shit too. Mm. Let's uh, let's go with someone who just has a problem sleeping, doesn't yeah. take anything, takes a little Tylenol PM. Great. Or something. I I would just start training them. I mean, doing a brain map and brain assessment, figure out which patterns are driving their sleep issues. And usually it's some of the patterns involving too much beta activity toward the middle and back of the head. Sometimes it's the same patterns that are producing some anxiety formations. And so I'll find these patterns, and then I'll just start training, you know, decrease amounts of beta, increase amounts of alpha or theta, bringing those slower brain waves up. Um, maybe train up the sleep spindles, which is what keeps you deeply asleep once you fall asleep. It prevents you from kind of being woken by all the outside stimuli. And what would you train this with? With biofeedback. You know, measure, because you're making all brain waves all the time. This is something people often don't know. Right now, Joe, you're making delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, and other brain waves we haven't named. You're making all of them all the time. Other ones we haven't named, we haven't identified them either? We've identified them, but we haven't really named them. You know, the, uh, the in, in order of... Uh, 
um, of discovery, alpha was the first one. Alpha is the first Greek letter. But alpha is t about 10 hertz, 10 cycles per second. And there's at least two or three waves slower than alpha that we discovered later. So in order of going from slow to fast, it's delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma. And gamma traditionally stops at 40 hertz, 40 cycles per second. But brainwaves go up to about two or even 300 cycles per second. Wow. But we haven't necessarily given those functional you know, bands different names beyond gamma. So is it bio, is there any biodiversity? Like, does everybody have the same sort of frequencies? Everyone has the on? same functional frequencies, but you, know, you might have more alpha than I do. You know, as a, as a baseline. And so when I'm doing the brain maps, this is a, it's a really good question. When I'm doing the brain maps, I'll take baselines. Let's say have you sit with your eyes closed for five minutes and record your eyes closed, you know, resting state, and then I'll record eyes open, resting state. The brain's very different, eyes open and eyes closed. I mean, very, very different typically. And so I'll take that baseline data and compare it to a normative database with thousands of brains in it and get, you know, heat maps, picture maps out of that that tell me how different you are than the population. Statistically, how much of that varies based on intention, based on uh, not much at all. A QEEG or brain map is stable year after year after year oh. after year, barring maturation, medication, or head injury. What about sleep? Um, if somebody's really sleep deprived, there are some differences in the QEEG. But if there are a little bit, a little bit of vagaries in sleep here and there, don't actually affect the um, the sleep. It's much more important, like caffeine status and psychostimulant status, those things are a much bigger deal when I'm doing brain recordings than, Damn. than how rested you are. I mean, folks come in having not slept, it's not a very valid reading. Or having been, you know, drunk the night before, it's not a valid reading. But if someone's just like, ah, oh, I got seven hours, not nine hours, ah, oh, no problem. You know, and uh, then statistically we say, okay, you know, let's say your brain has X amount of alpha with your eyes open. If it's too much, that means you're spacey. Too much theta means you're impulsive. Too much beta in the back might mean you're... Uh, anxious. You know, different asymmetries in the front, maybe you're depressed. And so I'll see five to ten of these big patterns. I draw some arbitrary line in the sand, you know, more than one and a half standard deviations I consider clinically relevant or problematic, maybe. And then we sit and talk about all these patterns that rise to that, you know, outlier level and try to figure out, well, you know, this one can mean this. Is that true for you? Oh, it is. Okay, great. Let's believe that one. This one can mean this. This one can mean this. This. Oh, this one isn't true? Okay, let's a normal variant for you. Let's move on. So these are not diagnostic tests. They're more sort of prognostic where I'm guessing about what might be true. But the, the pattern, the brain mapping patterns don't fit into nice diagnostic boundaries. So, uh, you know, I might see like a really dramatic ADHD pattern and the person reports somewhat mild attention problems. But you know, if there's a dramatic outlier, three, four standard deviations out of range, chances are very good that thing is causing you some trouble in some way. I would like to do this, but I'm worried that I might find out I'm way more fucked up than I think I am. Well, everyone's a little <laughs> bit fucked up, you know? I mean, all brains are different. What about the Dalai Lama? He's pretty fucked up, too. He has He's to got be. that stupid robe on. Didn't he, didn't he have a major health crisis recently? I don't know. I think he did, yeah. yeah. I just say that I have a friend who had some experience with him and said he's kind of full of shit. Yeah, I have, I have a friend who um, grew up with him, actually. And, oh, yeah? Uh, they grew up together in, uh, in a monastery. and uh, That's hilarious. You know, he doesn't say much about him, but, but you know, he's, he's also a Tibetan guy, so he's pretty chill. Right. So uh, It's a weird way to live your life. Uh, as the reincarnation of a godhead, you know, or a, <laughs> a, a, a spiritual leader? Yeah. Yeah, right? I would say so. I think Steven Seagal is one of those, too, according to him, didn't he? <sighs> Gain some sort of reincarnation status. Did he? As an Aikido master, I'm sure. I actually him. initially was trained by the guy that was his first teacher. Really? And um, that teacher I do not like teaches through pain and intimidation. Really? Um, I, I, I'm not terribly impressed with Seagal's Aikido. How dare you? I know. It's, I mean, he's going to come kick my ass now. But, um, you know, I'm a, an Aikido person, and I haven't done it in a few years, but uh, I'm not that impressed with Seagal's lineage or his on-screen Aikido. Wow. How rude. I know. I know. I'm, I'm such a jerk. can't even believe you're saying this. Well, I don't know, understand Aikido that much, so I'm sure you would know more than me. To me, it looks cool, flipping people around. Shit. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It looks like you have to cooperate. It doesn't look like uh, it would work. I think if you shot a double on him and got a good grip on your hands, he's, he's going for a ride. Yeah, it's, it's you know, <laughs> most of Aikido is learning to recognize force coming at you and mm -hmm. not being in the way of it. Right. You just creep up on him slow and punch him in the face. As long as you're not, like, running at him. 
like with your hand over your head right, like right, this, right, I think right, you're going right, to be okay. Right, right, exactly. Although, you know, you can, you know, the, the angle of the hips and the eyes, I mean, you can sort of, mm -hmm. there's, there's a, a lot of Aikido, like a lot of martial arts is, is, is very heavy in the footwork. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you step to one side and pivot around, and by the time they've swung their fist, they're overbalanced now, and you can just kind of, you know, knock them over. Yeah, but you, you take an NCAA D1 wrestler, good luck. Put one of those guys against, you know, O Sensei or some of the people, the pinnacle of mm -hmm. Aikido, and I'd love to see that. Against I would me, too. kick my ass. Yeah, but against the best guy, you bring your best guy. I don't give yeah. a fuck. There, there actually were in the 70s several videotaped um, multi, uh, multi martial art um, competitions, expositions between mm -hmm. O Sensei, the founder, yeah. and several other principles of other martial arts. Can you watch that online? You can, yeah. yeah really? Yeah. yeah, I would like to watch that. What, so, um, how do you say this guy's name? O, sen o, o Sensei. O and then Sensei. Apostrophe Sensei. Um, he has, has a name that I don't remember, but uh, he was, he's known as O Sensei in Aikido. What do you recommend? Like, what video? Is there one specific um, one that I could look at? There's an exposition video from like the 70s that's sort of the big one that, that shows him, you know, knocking people over without touching them and things. You know, it's a little crazy. A little, yeah, but like, like not, not his friends, like you know, the karate master from Japan getting knocked over and things without him touching them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how do you a few think of that. that worked? Um, no, knowing what you know about the mind, probably because he, you know, gave a subtle cue that made them prepare to move in one way, and then switched it, and you know, they over essentially using their mind against them, overbalancing them. You know, you believe that? Yeah. Yeah. Really? You think that a guy can knock a guy over with his mind just by giving well, him subtle cues? Well, no. Cues? Yeah, like like shifting your weight to the person attacking you shifts their weight, and then move and then moving out of the way as the person falls over. That doesn't work. That is only going to work on someone who doesn't know how to fight. A hundred percent. Well, you should look at some of these videos. They're, I would uh, love to look uh, at them right now with you. Okay. Because let's see if you could pull that up. I have a vast, extensive experience in watching bullshit, especially martial arts bullshit, and. A lot of it comes from these uh, traditional martial artists that claim to be able to right. uh, anticipate and use people's well, power Well, there's very little them. claims being made by O-sensei. In fact, and he mm -hmm. doesn't claim that he has some ancient lineage that you know came down from the mountain. He created it from Tai Chi and mm -hmm. horses and sword forms and everything else. It's a modern art, not an ancient art. Well, there's se. some there's some martial arts that are very, the ancient martial arts that are very effective in actual hand-to-hand -hand competition, like judo, for right. instance. Very effective. Jiu-jitsu, of course. A derivative of and, and Aikido is not really judo. a hard martial art mm -hmm. like like a judo. I mean, Aikido is a jujitsu. A judi jujitsu. It's in that category, mm -hmm. but it's softer than judo it's or a kung re fu. Redistribution of energy martial art. You yeah. take someone's energy, use it against them. the The issue is, is this the gentleman? That's a sensei. Yeah. So this is someone coming at him. Okay, this is terrible. Show me something good, because this guy doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. That guy's running into him. See, this is the thing with all these these goddamn demonstrations. That guy's willingly cooperating. Well, yeah, I mean, look at that. This, he's, he's practicing the technique, and mm -hmm. practicing the technique, you either cooperate or your arm breaks. Well, this isn't even cooperating. This guy's throwing himself on the ground. This is silly. This guy's uh, running towards him and letting this guy clothesline him. Come on, that doesn't ever happen. The guy's just standing there. This would never work against a train fighter. Never. Not in a million years. You get an NCAA Division One wrestler, he's going to shoot on this guy, and this guy's going to be on his head in seconds. It just doesn't work. This is, I mean, this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at right. nonsense. Well, you're, you're looking at people practicing techniques, not right. a multi, Yeah, you let's know. see the multi. What, yeah. what, what should he look for? Uh, exposition, I think, and uh, I think it was in Japan. Maybe, maybe an exhibition or yeah. exposition. Uh, I think it was exhibition. Exhibition, not yeah. exposition. Yeah, exhibition. Tell me, one of those looks good. Uh, and then I think if you put either judo or karate, and you'll also find it because it was a multi martial art meeting mm -hmm. in, in the seventies. There's a lot of uh, fuckery when it comes to martial arts, and a lot of people that get trapped into all this fuckery, and I've met a lot of people that are very intelligent people that swear that their sensei is the guy that has the answers to right, all this right. jazz, and I just have, I've seen too much. I know how much of it is based on predis predetermined ideas that you have about yeah. this person's abilities. I make no claims about, you know, mm -hmm. my senseis, the people I've learned from being, you know, from on high. Mm -hmm. The first day I rode a motorcycle, I crashed it when flying through the air mm -hmm. and was standing on my feet watching the bike spin away 
because I was doing Aikido so much. Oh, I'm sure. Well, that's balance. You know, I mean, you can. There's a lot of videos of guys getting. There's a great video of a guy getting rear-ended while yeah. he's on a bike. He flips through the air and lands on his feet. Yeah, and it just. Balanced. Yeah, I was thrown. I landed on my shoulder on the on a street on tar and mm -hmm. was standing up watching the bike spin away with one little tiny tear in my shoulder because I took the force of being thrown. Uh, the way I had my, my body had been trained. Well, I'm definitely not saying that learning how to fall isn't a, a huge skill to have if you want to ride a motorcycle and fall down. Right. I mean, learning how to fall is a big part of both judo and jujitsu yep, yep. and aikido oh, yeah, and yeah, a yeah. lot of different martial arts. But this motherfucker's not stopping anybody from okay. taking him down. I'm telling you right now, that old dude with his clothesline technique. Well, this is hard to see with that kind of shit. Those it's also, demonstrations it's also are so hard to it's also foolish. hard to to pick apart, you know, from from here. Mm -hmm. If you were in the in the the dojo watching the footwork, you might you know perceive it a little bit differently. Not, watching someone who's not a ninety year old guy with a with a with a, a, um, a polite student. Right. You know, th there are different. Uh, right. That's why I want to see some real shit. I've never seen it. I've, I've every single one of those. I mean, I've seen some judo demonstrations where there was a one that we played recently was amazing. There was this old judo, but the way he moved was logical. I mean, I, I understood that what he was doing was effective. Yeah. Based on my knowledge of the human sure, body sure. and movement, that's not. That's I'm, I'm watching some cooperation there. I'm watching right. a guy run into this guy's punches or this guy's yeah. forearms. Got anything, Jamie? No. Okay. That sounds interesting. A Turkish wrestler versus an Aikido guy. Okay. Let's see. First of all, the wrestler looks like he's about 60. <laughs> and who knows if he's really a wrestler. Takes him down, like I yeah. thought. Mount, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Taps him, head and arm choke. That's what I thought. Now, let's see this again. Okay, he's going to try it again. Okay, here he goes. Grabs him, throws him to the ground again. Grabs him, throws him to the ground. Yeah, this is what I expected. Exactly. See, this is what happens in real life. This is what happens. This is an arm bar. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who's not even good at arm bars. He needs the left leg over the face. That's, that's reality. This shit doesn't work. And there's, it's a beautiful art to practice. It looks cool, but it's n like as far as like efficacy and actual grappling against a skilled well, yeah, grappler. Yeah, but, but the goal is not skilled grappling. The goal is to learn how force works when your body's flying through the air. Right. And when someone's punching in the face, I learn how that force is coming at you to be safe. The goal is not to strike. Many Aikido places don't even teach much in the way of attacks. Well, that guy wasn't striking him. That guy just grabbed him. Right. But I'm saying that it's not a me against you conflict art it is let's work on playing around with forces that are moving between us together i totally understand that and i think it was initially developed to disarm people with a weapon when someone would come at you with yeah. a weapon to use the yeah. energy of that weapon to take it away from them i just think as far as an actual martial art it's one of the least effective in real practice I mean, yeah, but the, again, the goal is not necessarily face-to-face -face combat. You know, if you, you can pick other things that are more military and are trying to kill, the, when the goal is kill, the goal is not killing or meeting force with force. The goal is keeping people safe right. in Aikido. That's the why goal I in like Krav wrestling. Maga is to kill you or right. to kill your opponent as quickly as possible. Well, that's why, I, them. that's why I brought up wrestling, because wrestling, the goal isn't kill you either. Wrestling, the, the goal, goal is to, get is to just points, hold though. on to you. Well, the goal is to control control your body, which mm -hmm. it would be probably the most effective way to avoid getting hurt. If you had someone coming at you, if you can control their body, they can't hurt you. Hurt sure, you. sure. But controlling yourself is probably the, the, the higher uh, focus on Aikido, I would say. I think you're fucking buying some mumbo-jumbo, pal. Maybe, I think maybe. they got you. Maybe they do. Maybe I've been, I've been indoctrinated. Well, there's just a long history of that stuff where it's like a part of people's uh, map of the world. You know, you have your model of the world of what's effective and what's not effective. And... One of the like, there's a lot of people that don't like the idea of mixed martial arts because it's not in in many ways it's not traditional martial arts mm -hmm. and some of the uh, some of the positive benefits of traditional martial arts have sort of been cast aside yeah. in favor of mohawk tattooed right. savages. Right, right. But the reality is a lot of the ideas that powered those traditional martial arts beliefs are bullshit mm -hmm. and we thought they were real for a long time and there was only one way to find out if they were real and that was yeah, yeah. competition yeah and in competition you find that the reality is 
most of that stuff doesn't work. But yeah, but you know, that's, that's also competition. I mean, I've been attacked in bars. Mm -hmm. You know, someone grabs me in a bar, and before they know it, I'm standing next to them, and they're not interested in attacking me anymore because their wrist is, you know, in pain or they're on the ground or, you know, that, that's happened to me. I've, I've used this stuff in real world environments, not against some like, you know, professional wrestler who's coming right. at me, but against some asshole in a bar. Right. You know, it's, a, it's, it's very valid. It's very useful. Okay. What that means to me is it works great as long as a guy doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Well, what you know, you a traditional a martial, martial artist, artist isn't going to walk around trying to kick people's asses. That's what an unskilled asshole does. Yeah, but it's not, that's not the point, but that's not necessarily the true. Because you could run into someone who's an asshole who's skilled and just they have issues. They yeah, have, maybe. you know, they could have emotional issues. There's a lot of people that are skilled fighters that go and pick fights. Yeah, I suppose. And if you have Aikido and they have that, you're going to get fucked up. No, because I'm not going to engage with their fight. I'm going to step aside when they, you know. And also these guys are drinking beer in the bar. They're, 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 they're drunk and You're in the bar, jerks. too. But, I don't, but I, I don't get out of control with alcohol. <laughs> you're assuming they do, though. I think Absolutely the, the best I'm assuming they martial do. arts will work on trained killers. And Aikido just doesn't. Okay. It's just, you, I don't I want to shatter beliefs, but this is a, a, an important subject to me because it's something that I went through my entire adult life. And as a young man, I, I kind of went through the broad spectrum of what to believe in, what not to yeah. believe in. And I have no problem arts. that it's not a competitive martial art and, and you know, it doesn't, doesn't work the way mm -hmm. wrestling or, or Krav Maga or karate, you know, or judo. I'm, I'm okay with it being not a uh, as practical as those. I still think there's incredible benefit in learning to use your body and keep yourself safe in a crisis environment. Well, there's there's benefit in gymnastics. You know, mm -hmm. there's benefit in a lot of different things that I would look. One of the best uh, like platforms for going into jujitsu we're recently finding is break dancing. Hmm. These breakdancing guys, there's a whole team of them from 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu that started out as breakdancers. And these guys have this incredible athletic ability mm -hmm. because they learned how to support themselves on one hand, right, do handstands right, right. and spin around. Right. And they can manipulate their bodies in these incredibly unique ways. And these guys, I mean, you'd never think of breakdancing being a martial art. But when, once these guys learn basic positions, they're so good at them. Cause so they're, they're, I would say that the same is true of an Aikidoka. You can take someone who's learned that and put them in a, a more you know, hard form. They're going to have skills that descend from balance, posture, moving around your center, moving from a strong place. I that, would agree. I would that, agree. You know, Most certainly. I just would, I would be real concerned, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so adamant about this, I'm very nervous about people getting inaccurate ideas uh -huh. in their head, and I've seen it in action. I mean, we used to have guys when I was uh, my competition days that would come to the gym that had come from some crazy kung fu sp mm -hmm. martial art where they had this distorted perception of reality, and they would spar with people who actually knew how to fight, and they would get knocked out. It yeah, was horrible yeah. to watch because they had this idea in their head of who they were, right. and then in practice, it just well, didn't work Nobody at all. in an Aikido center has an idea of themselves as a sparring fighter. That's no, not but the, they have the idea of themselves as how well they would be able to keep someone away from them. Uh, yeah, if somebody grabs them or comes like running at them. that guy that we just saw get yeah. tackled over and over again very sure. easily. Sure, but the, you know, I wouldn't let that guy tackle me. I, I just wouldn't have been there. What do you mean you wouldn't have been there? He would have come at me. I would have stepped to one side and just not but been But don't you think that guy wanted to do that? No, because he was, he was trying for a specific technique. He was like, grab my arm and I'll, I'll do the technique I'm thinking of. So do you think that if you were in a matted room with someone who's a trained grappler, you'd be able to keep them away from you? For longer than that guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not much longer. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta but, try that. A lot of people have ideas in their head of what is possible. Yeah, but you gotta put that in action. I mean, action. I'm, I'm also heavily trained in restraining people. Mm -hmm. How so? I mean, I restrained people in psych hospitals for several years. That was my right. job. Crazy people flipping out, mm -hmm. throwing chairs. You know, six foot five, three hundred pound people, and I can restrain them alone, often, or with one other person. You know, one of the things that I think would be really interesting to talk to you about specifically is what is going on in the mindset of someone who is engaging in conflict. Because one of the most important aspects of any physical altercation is being yeah. able to keep your wits about yeah. you. Yeah.
Um, you know, violence, conflict causes a huge surge in adrenaline, cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Um, and it shuts down the connections between the, the executive, the CEO of the brain, and the other parts of the brain. We sort of have a, a, a dual track brain or mind almost. Where we have top down resources and bottom up resources. So there's automatic things that happen. Like I can't look at the picture behind you without seeing it. Mm -hmm. That's bottom up. That's automatic. And then there's top down, you know, how, how I interpret what I'm seeing or how I decide to feel about it. That's you know, uh, top down versus bottom up. Um, a lot of the bottom up stuff in crisis and in violence is what takes over. And the top down ability for your, your intentions, your perceptions, your moment to moment perspective on your brain or on your reality, that goes away in a crisis. And the PFC, the prefrontal cortex gets shut down, or at least its connections between the PFC and the rest of the brain get shut down a little bit and you go into automatic deal with the crisis mode. I wish we could monitor that in competitive martial arts contests because I've seen it time and time again where people are professionals and they yeah. have a long experience of competition, but they get to the big event, whether yep. it's fighting yep. for the world championship, fighting a contender, the main event on a big show, and they freeze. Totally. You see, you see the nerves, you the see the adrenaline lock kicks up. up and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, I used to be, a, in college, I was a fencer, uh, and I fenced a lot, you know, uh, weapons. And um, most of the time, it's pretty chill. I'm left-handed, which is an advantage in fencing often. And so I was pretty, you know, I was pretty good in, at, at my school. I was one of the better people. But then you go to these big events, and the adrenaline kicks in, and there's, a, you know, spectators and, and a crowd. It's a very different environment. Mm. You know, like in state-dependent learning, where you learn skills in one set of uh, contexts, and if the context change too much, the skills may not be there. So these fighters who get to the big event haven't practiced in the big event room or with enough noise or enough flooding or enough, you know, caring about the fight right? to the point where they can bring the same resources online that they learned. You know, it's like musicians. Uh, I'm sure you know some musicians who can't play unless they're stoned because mm -hmm. that's the only way they've ever played music. Right. Yeah. State dependent learning. So that's, that's, a, that's always overblown. It's not quite as dramatic an effect as we think it is. You see it with stand up comedy too. Uh, you see some, po sometimes people can work well with small crowds, very little pressure. Uh -huh. And then if you put them in front of a large crowd, they're, <coughs> uh -huh. you, you literally see them constrict. Yeah. And some of that's this, the, the sweet spot they're used to, to living in, right? There's the, there's the stress response curve. It's an inverted U, the Yerkes Dodgson curve and a little bit of stress. It's sort of stress versus performance on two axes. A little bit of stress means better performance, a little more stress, better performance, a little more stress, performance plateaus, a little more stress, performance degrades. And this can be like stressors, like I'm stressed out or just physiologic arousal, heart beating, you know, getting ready to do something. A little bit of this stuff is good. A lot of it is not good. And if you're not used to existing, not used to performing in a mode on the far end of that curve, your performance is gone. Yeah, it so. seems like there's a, a wall that they hit that's unexpected. Yeah. And then they just get this, like, I didn't think this wall was going to be yeah. here. Now what? Well, they're and used to they... performing somewhere in the top of the curve mm -hmm. where they're stressed out enough or they're or physiologically aroused enough to perform very, very well. But a little more stress, reaction time's down, judgment's down awareness, memory, learning, all these things are impaired. In that sense, do you think there's anything that you could do that would help athletes compete under massive amounts of pressure? Like yeah, I do actually. Um, this sleep spindle that we tend to train up called SMR, sensory motor rhythm in the, in the brain, seems to improve athletic performance. It's used a lot in golfers who are trying to get in the zone. Mm. Um, and the way, and, you know, most neurofeedback is this non-voluntary operant shaping, but with golfers, you follow them on the golf course with a laptop, and when their brain goes in, and they get ready, they, they, they they tee up and get ready to you know, strike the ball. Um, and then they wait until the computer makes a noise and tells them, okay, you're in the zone now. And then they release and you hit the ball. And so there they're trying to associate being in the, the feeling of being in the zone with performing, with you know, delivering the, the golf pulse, uh, the, the, the club swing or something. Is it one of those things that's very difficult to replicate because a lot of times being in the zone means almost like you're, you're in that zen state. Right, which is why you're training the brain to go there again and again and again and, to know, and, you're, and you're giving an audio, an audio cue so you start to recognize, oh, that tone means zone. That's what it feels like right now. Okay. And if you reinforce that association, if you're pointing at that state and saying, up oh, there it is, there's your brain, it's in that state, you get sort of more able to access it.
Is it difficult term. to replicate when you have a guy there with a laptop? It seems like an for, almost... For, for, for golfing, it is. There's several sports um, and performance-oriented neurofeedback approaches these days, and they all are somewhat similar. You know, reducing the stress response and increasing attention to keep you in that sweet spot to some extent. You know what would be fascinating? If you monitored the brain waves of fighters leading right up to the moment you got in, they got into the cage mm -hmm. and then take the equipment off of mm -hmm. them, let them compete, and then find out where the winners were when they stepped in and mm -hmm. where the losers were. That might work. Um, the brain also sometimes changes its states very, very quickly. Oh. And so it, it, you know, because it's a lead up to an event, you probably would get relevant data. Um, but uh, you know, you're right. You have to take the equipment off when you're actually physically moving around. So especially if you're going to get hit, uh, just movement. Muscles are also electrical. Oh, okay, right. And so any muscle movement causes a burst of noise, which swamps the brain measurements. So you would get a lot of noise, even if they're warming up. Yeah, it wouldn't really work. Yeah, pretty much. So you'd have to kind of measure them, like in stillness, as they were about to step into the cage, and that would take too much time. Might not. I mean, it depends on what you're measuring. When I do assessments, it's a full head of EEG and gelled caps and things. But you can stick a single wire and ear clip on someone's head and measure EEG. How long would it take? Thirty seconds. That might be worth studying. Like, and then you know, me bet. measure for a 30 second baseline or something? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but I would think that there would be some interesting data that you would get based on. I mean, it would be really fascinating if we found out. Well, look at this. All of the winners were in this zone, yeah. and all of the losers were in this area. Yeah, you'd probably find increased fast alpha, sort of flow state, um, you know, a lot of beta, but not a lot of very fast beta, so focus, but not anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, probably very low amounts of slow brainwaves like delta and theta, which happen when you're dreaming or creative or checked out. So my guess is as you know, the performance would be correlated with better access to flow states and focus states and less presence of anxiety states and distractible states. There's so much to learn when it comes to the human mind. This is such a fascinating subject of conversation because most people have no idea of what's going on below the surface. It's like we have this yeah. unbelievably powerful supercomputer that's running our reality and we don't have a clue yep. as to how to operate the it. The most complicated machine we know about. You know, three pounds, but more connections in the brain than there are stars in the galaxy. Yeah, when I did this uh, infinite monkey cage with Brian Cox recently, mm -hmm. and they were talking about how much more complex a frog is than the universe. Yeah. I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. I yeah. can't. You can't. Theoretically, the human brain can store more bits of information than there are atoms in the universe. <laughs> Now, we Jesus. don't store all that information, but we're never going to run out of storage space. The, it, this is a bit of a, a cheat, but the, the rubric for that is um, you take the number of neurons you have, let's say 100 billion. We have more, but 100 billion. And you think about the connections they can make with other neurons. So 100 billion neurons tied to 100 billion neurons. And let's ignore recurrent connections. And let's ignore connections from one neuron to multiple, which does absolutely happen. It's actually the rule versus the exception. And let's ignore the fact that glial cells, which are also in brain cells, are also computational. Let's just take the neurons and just take the neurons connected to all the neurons. So number of neurons raised to the power of the number of neurons. So 100 billion raised to the power of 100 billion. That number is larger than the estimate of atoms in the universe. Jesus Christ. So you can store more bits of information than there are bits of information. That's insane. We should end with that. Perfect. It's a, the ultimate mind fuck, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. You're welcome. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, it's been absolutely. an amazing, amazing conversation. Oh, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed really it. Really fascinating. Um, your stuff that you, people, if you're interested, it's called True Brain. This is the uh, nootropic blend, the three different ones. Uh, I tried the, the one with caffeine, which you said tastes the least good, and it was pretty good. Nice. Um, and your center is called Alternatives. Uh, yeah, Alternatives Brain Institute. We can get, you can access to both the websites at alternativesbh.com, which is behavioral health, and then truebrain, T-R-U-Brain.com. Really, really fascinating. Thank you very much. Really appreciate pleasure, you coming Jim. on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll be back in a couple of hours with Duncan Trussell. So uh, we'll see you then. Much love. Bye-bye. Cool. Oh.